Marjorie Egan. You are listening to Boston Public Radio, 89.7 GBH. We are broadcasting live from the Boston Public Library, as we do every Tuesday. Thank you, Wednesday and Friday. And we are streaming at youtube.com slash GBH News. I want to tell you about a special thing we're doing. We don't usually travel much, except between here and Brighton. But on May 3rd, we are going to be at UMass Boston over in Dorchester, that gorgeous campus on the water there. There's going to be an addition there of BPR. Governor Moore Healy is going to be with us. Gina McCarthy used to run the EPA for the Obama administration. Paul English, a philanthropist and the guy who started Kayak and a bunch of other great things, including this pretty cool dating site, too. And Marcelo Suarez Orozco. He is a, a big deal there over at the University of Massachusetts. I think he's the dean or the chancellor or something like chancellor. that. He's a big deal. Very We're big deal. celebrating his elevation. We're celebrating his elevation. That's right. He's Whoever taking he over is, UMass right. is Whatever what he's doing. Exactly. Okay, so if you want to come and join us, we're going to be at University hour. Hall. Him, no, Rose. well, he's a very impressive guy. He News, is impressive. As I said, he's a very big deal Whoever, whatever at UMass, he does, he's Dorchester. Thank you. Good morning, Jim. Hey there, how are you? Uh, very well, Since you. you promoted things so beautifully, I want to promote, we're about 30 minutes away from some of the most hauntingly beautiful music yes, you have gorgeous. ever heard in your life. And if you're not checking us out on YouTube or you're in the neighborhood, just come on down. It's this music inclusion ensemble and the music is just spectacular. So we officially have our final 12 jurors in the first criminal trial ever of a former president, in this case, Donald J. Trump. Juror number 11 said this yesterday. I don't like his persona, how he presents himself in public. I don't like some of my coworkers, but I don't try to sabotage their work. That person <laughs> is on the jury. Jury selection continues today. They have to pick, I think it's five more alternates, and then theoretically, opening statements on Monday. So Marjorie and I are gonna break our two-day streak of not discussing uh, defendant Trump on air with you. Our number is 877-301-8970. That's the number to call or text. Now that this historic trial is upon us, are you like me, totally consumed by every detail of this thing? Or are you like, I mean, a lot of people out there who call us distancing yourself from all things Trump, burned out after nearly a decade of headlines and heartaches, heartbreak, and thinking a criminal conviction of Donald J. Trump is just simply never going to happen. 877-301-8970. So this is day four. How are you doing? Well, you know, I get why people want to draw back from this because it's very depressing and it's very upsetting mm -hmm. and people aren't happy with the presidential race mm -hmm. coming up and, yeah. and to hear all these. This is going to be kind of a... I mean, let's face it, we're dragging in the National Enquirer and Catch and Kill stories and dating adult film stars and paying them off and play. I mean, it's just... And interfering in an election, an allegedly. Election. It's, just pretty, it's just pretty sleazy and depressing of stuff. So I, I get why people... But, you know, this is what I do for a living, Jim. So I am, uh, I am watching every move with bated breath. You know, uh, one of the things that was incredible to me, first of all, I think for the most part, this BS that Trump's being treated like any other person who's on a criminal, who's a criminal defense, is this total crap, as we've discussed. The fact that this gag order, which he has violated repeatedly by threatening witnesses, indirectly threatening the jury by quoting that Jesse Waters from Fox News, and there's not even a hearing till Tuesday. The one thing I have to say, I hate to say Trump may be being treated unfairly. This woman who's on the jury, I don't like his persona, how he presents himself in public. I'd say two things about that. One, I would get myself a food taster if I were her. <laughs> and number two, are you amazed that the judge well, didn't... There were hundreds of people in the jury pool. It's not a little tiny jury pool. Are you amazed this person made it onto the jury? You know, I, I think we've got to stop at, at bending over backwards uh, the court system in general, the criminal justice system in general, by treating Trump like we can't do anything that's going to annoy people. You know, we can't... I'm not talking about annoying people. Well, the, I think this is annoying, it, it, annoying the people that, that, that like the guy, that, oh, we can't possibly do what we do anybody else that was in this situation now, which is put him in the lockup. I'm not what I'm talking about. Well, I'm saying if you were the defendant in this case yeah and the juror the prospective juror now juror said i don't like marjorie's persona i don't like how she presents herself in public how do you feel having that woman well, on the jury maybe he ran out of his 10 uh you know peremptory, peremptory challenges, challenges. well maybe. the judge could have struck this the juror. judge could have struck him but i mean I, I i think he's got i think frankly i think the the jury's going to be 
tough for him. I, I think it's going to be based not, on what? Just because you got two lawyers on there, you got a finance guy on there, you got uh, people that are that are there are three of them that don't pay attention to the news at all. But a lot of the other ones, if they're telling the truth, are getting their news from legitimate uh, news sources uh, like uh, the New York Times and uh, and the Wall Street Journal. I mean, those are both Wall Street Journal is a very conservative paper, but I think in general the news pages, not the op-eds, but the news pages are are fact based as opposed to Fox News where they lie on a regular basis. Or well, wait, when you say two lawyers, though, Rudy Giuliani is a lawyer. I mean, why do you think that they are going to be unsympathetic or at least be, let's, driven by the facts of the case as opposed to some personal agenda? I, I just think that when you have um, pe people that, uh, that are paying attention to what's going on in the world and are paying attention to this presidency and they're from Manhattan, I, I think that this is a... This is a jury that could be tough for him. That's what I think. I think you're straining. But to, but here's what I also. But, I, but get back to what we said before, though. What do we say? I, I mean, you know, we talked about Frank Luntz, the Republican. He had pollster. a stroke, by the way. I know, yesterday which is day which before, is yeah. uh, very fortunate. I hope he gets better soon because he's uh, you know he does a lot of fascinating work as a pollster. But he was on television a couple of weeks ago mm. saying that Letitia James went after Trump's properties. Mm -hmm. That would be it. He'd become a martyr and mm -hmm. he would be elected president. And there's a lot of thinking like that. It's like the Merrick Garland school of justice where while everybody else is breaking all the rules you have to act like we're going to be above the fray we're not going to do anything we're not going to get in the gutter and i don't want people to get in the gutter but i want them to the judicial system to stop giving him passes that nobody else would get for fear of the reaction to his not I'm getting those you. passes and i wish the judge had said that's it you start, you start intimidating jurors, you start intimidating jurors, Mr. Trump, because fine, who cares if he gets a $1,000 fine? It doesn't make it, wouldn't matter if it was a $500,000 fine. I agree Because he'd appeal it, we say he wouldn't have to pay it. So you it. think he should go in the can because of what I he think if he posted keeps yesterday? Up, yeah, I think you, you should treat him like you treat anybody else and stop getting the special treatment. I think the judiciary has been... Um, Disgraced itself. I do, particularly the Supreme Court. They've totally disgraced themselves. So I think this judge, whom I admire so far, except for this, should do what he'd do if this was defendant John Doe. Speaking of the Supreme Court, are we carrying NPR's coverage of the oral argument? Next, next Thursday is finally the oral argument before the Supreme Court on Trump's immunity claim, which is what's holding up the key trial, the insurrection-related uh, charges. We will carry the oral argument live, because even though there are no cameras there, unlike New York State, they at least have an audio broadcast or some such thing. 877-301-897. We want to get your reaction to three days plus, I guess, a couple of hours of the trial of uh, the state of New York. I guess that's the plaintiff for the... Pro, the uh, people prosecuting him, or maybe the people in Manhattan, against Donald J. Trump. Joyce and I, I just want to mention we're having problems with the text messages. Hope to get them back up soon. So if you're texting, I can't read them yet, but um, hold on. But we feel them. We Joyce feel in them. Cambridge, <laughs> you're first on Boston Public Radio. Welcome, Joyce. Hi. Yeah, hi. Thanks. Uh, frequent, all of you listener and frequent uh, some caller. Thanks. Um, I love you guys. You Thanks. think you're incredible. Yeah, um, thank you. Uh, so just uh, what I've been hearing a lot on the whole, I, uh, let me make sure. I'm listening to you on the phone, so, um, in my car. Yeah. Uh, my concern is that you've actually sort of a little bit disgusted while I was waiting. The issue is that there are two attorneys on the jury pool, and that uh, people, I've heard different opinions, that uh, they concern that the attorneys, on the one hand, will be able to handle the more complicated financial uh, material. And so is the jury, which is not your usual uh, uh, working class jury, that they, uh, they need someone more educated, as these people are, in order to be able to handle the complicated uh, material in the, in the jury, in the, in, the, in the court. Number two, uh, do you think that the jury, that the having attorneys, one is a civil attorney and another one is a corporate attorney, yeah. uh, that they might sway the jury's opinion because the juries will think that attorneys sound like they know Got more it. about it and that it. it might have their opinion. Joyce, okay. thank you for the question. We discussed with Andrew Cabral yesterday. I have never heard of a jury with two lawyers on it in my life. Criminal, so I sort of am a lawyer. And this is anecdotal, Joyce, so it's the best answer I can give you. I was on a civil trial, a slip and fall thing, I don't know, 15 years ago. And I go in there thinking I'm going to be running the show. And none of them gave a damn what I had to say about anything. I mean, maybe, I mean, I was treated equally, but jurors, I, I, 
I've been disparaging of jur juries through most of my life until I was well, on not a jury. Me. I and, like them. And I have to say, yeah. everybody on that jury took that case really, really seriously. And we had political differences, as I learned, but people really took the job seriously. So while I'm troubled by the two lawyer thing, I, I, I'm not convinced that the other 10 members of the jury are just going to defer to the, are they both men? I think it's well, both men. You know, two men. Uh, Joyce, thanks for the call. It's not to me so much that they're going to understand the law. It's one of the things you find, but the, the people that are most devoted to Trump, generally speaking, are, are white men who didn't go to college. Mm -hmm. And um, the more educated you are, the more, less likely you are to be mm -hmm. in favor of Trump. I'm not a fan of the president. I think he's very dangerous I and scary that, yes. and all that. Mm -hmm. uh, so I would like to think that, that, that these people may not be uh, people that are... Uh, thinking that Trump walks on water as some of the people that he support him do. That's, that's where I'm at. Well, and again, the based on what? Based on what? Because the, the people who support Trump, that's, what, that's who supports Trump for the Attorney most part. Attorney General Barr disparaged Trump after he let him, said he was a, basically right, acted like a five-year-old. Right. He just endorsed him two days he ago. He did. Being but, a lawyer means nothing. Well, I, well I, I differ with you on that one. I mean, okay. the, the, the Republican politicians, and Barr's a politician as far as I'm concerned, they're all doing this. I don't know if it's because they want to get, uh, they don't want to be harassed or they want to get money from Fox News or I don't know what it is. But, they, but Bill Barr is not supporting him because he thinks he's terrific. Mitt Romney and Charlie Baker are not supporting him, by the way. So by the way, here's an anonymous text talking about following the news. Yeah. I'm following closely all day during the week, but I have a friend in the Netherlands who posts live updates on Facebook. On the weekends, I refuse to allow TV to be in the news. My husband loathes Trumps and therefore his weekend rants when the news is on are exhausting. You know, that's part of it too. I think people need to take a break from this whole thing. We used to be able to take a break, as I've said a million times, you know, the president was elected, your guy won, your guy lost, mm -hmm. or woman, if it happened to be uh, Hillary Clinton. We haven't Clinton. had that many women presidents so we've far. Only had, we've only had a we've one. We've only had none, actually. We've had none, but we had yes. one who ran and lost. I remember and the that. point is, you could just go on with your normal life. Can. And that is all over now. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, can't, <laughs> we can't get away from this guy who's living in our brains, and I wish um, he weren't living in our brains So, anymore. by the way, I don't know if you guys know, we've mentioned in the past, one of our favorite, I don't know, comic things is Triumph the Comic, yeah. the insult comic dog, who got his start. Robert Smigel, is that the guy who holds the puppet, the dog, right? On Conan O'Brien. So, he goes to things like, he went to the Michael Jackson trial, he went to the premiere of Star Wars, he goes to things the dog does and talks to people. So, the dog, Triumph the Insult comic dog, a couple of days ago, went to talk to Trump supporters who were outside the trial in New York City. You'll hear the dog talking, and then you'll hear a woman who's there to support Trump. Here it is. You know, it's very sad. You know, this man is almost 80 years old, and they're putting him through these long trials. First this one, then there's three more. He's going to have to go through maybe four trials. God will give him the strength. God will give him the strength? Yes, Thank God, I hope so, because seriously, four trials, that means he has to have the strength to threaten the lives of 48 Jews. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, from your mouth. If you didn't hear it, uh, Triumph Comic Insult Dog said, I hope so, because seriously, four trials, that means he has to have the strength to threaten the lives of 48 jurors. 877-301-8970. I'll tell you, as much as I'd like to be on a jury, particularly this jury, mm -hmm. wouldn't you worry that some of Trump's supporters found out who you were? Absolutely. Well, that's what happened to juror number two, that's exactly the right. nurse, right? That's right. I mean, that's and, they, right. and they didn't identify where she worked. They just said she was an oncology nurse, she lived on the Upper yep. East Side. Her fiancé was a guy who worked in finance. They had no children. That was it. Mm -hmm. But but friends and family began calling her and saying, oh, you're one of the Trump jurors. And she freaked out. It's, it's, and we've said... And she many, asked off the jury and she was allowed And she was the allowed off the jury. And as we said before, many Republican politicians, Congress people, I know this. have said that they, are, they were afraid to go up against Trump because they were afraid for attacks not only on themselves and their families. So naturally, if you're somebody that's just got called into jury duty and you're not a politician, you're just a regular Jane or Joe, yeah, I absolutely get why you would be afraid of somebody coming after you. Chris but do you know what they might be saying? That what? if they vote to convict, at least they'll die happy. I mean, maybe that's <laughs> a, I don't know. I'm just speculating. <laughs> Listen to this. This What's brings that? up the issue if, if you're in a, uh, you know, if, you, if, you, if your spouse or your girlfriend or boyfriend, Torian Fitchberg says, his watching this is driving his girlfriend crazy and he is unable to stop watching. I'm unable to stop watching. Well, you can't watch, watching the commentary and the reporting. Chris in Boston, welcome. Hi. Hey, Jim Marjorie. So good to hear you all today. Thank and, you. Uh, 
I just wanted to say that, you know, I, I completely sympathize with Marjorie's point about how it seems like the Justice Department is tiptoeing around Trump. We don't want to upset him or his followers. You know, I don't have all the facts, but I would say that it does seem like, especially in light of January 6th, that a large amount of Trump's followers, the really extreme ones, are heavily armed. And what's more, a lot of them are active duty police officers, law enforcement officers. So even if we could go after the people that are threatening jurors or whoever, like, how do we know that the law enforcement agents are also aren't Trump supporters? That's a sticky situation. I'm not justifying it. I'm just pointing that out. Yeah, by the way, we um, should be clear. I don't yeah. know of any jurors who've been threatened so far. We do know that one juror who asked to be excused after being on the jury for one day was concerned. Uh, and I would be concerned, too. But in, in fairness to uh, Donald Trump supporters, many of whom, some of whom are armed and some of whom do do dangerous things, as we learned on January 6th, we don't know specific uh, threats. But I have to say, obviously, the judges worry about them or the judge wouldn't say to the uh, media, you cannot report the current or former employer of any juror. Chris, thanks for the call. Of course, just to put it in context, we were talking last week about how these college basketball players who uh, miss a three yes. <laughs> free throw and it ruins the spread of somebody who's bet on the game, the game yeah. they're getting death threats <laughs> the yes. moment they get off the court. So we seem to be death threat happy in the United States of America saying, let's hope that uh, that nobody is really serious. Can you serious. stay on that one second? We talk, remember a couple of weeks ago with that restaurant, I can't think of the name of the North End, and she got into well, a there thing were death threats with there. a customer. Yep. This is a dispute over a $250 cancellation fee. A reservation. And both the <laughs> restaurant owner and the guy in New York City who canceled the reservation yeah. were getting death threats. That's the language of this agreement in the era of you-know-who. I think we should have everybody has to sign their name. And they, then they'll I be afraid so to do this with, Well, kind Dan of stuff. Kennedy did that yeah, immediately. Make everybody yeah. say who they Good are, friend. and maybe they wouldn't be threatening everybody to, to kill them at dawn. Anyway, we were talking about whether you are keeping in track of all this or whether you're obsessed, like Jim is, with watching everything so about President what Trump's imminent about. trial. Or if you are sick of it and want to keep the peace and have a nice, pleasant weekend and not even think about it. And whether your faith in the justice is teetering uh, as we see these cases be delayed and delayed and delayed and delayed. At least this one's going to trial. You're listening to Boston Public Radio, 89.7 GBH. We are broadcasting live from the Boston Public Library and streaming at youtube.com slash GBH News. Voters in India head to the polls. 969 million people are registered. This could be India's largest election in history, with a lot at stake for Modi's government. I'm Carolyn Beeler. A preview as the world's largest democracy begins to cast its ballots next time on The World. This afternoon at 3, here on GBH News 89.7. Funding for our programs comes from you. And New England Recovery Center, providing inpatient addiction treatment in state-of-the-art facilities located in Westboro, Mass. Learn more at newenglandrecoverycenter.org or by calling 1-877-MY-REHAB. And Hebrew Senior Life, a Harvard Medical School affiliate empowering seniors to reach their full potential through senior living, health care, aging research, and more. You can consider Hebrew Senior Life at allweareforyou.org. Welcome back to Boston Public Radio. Jim Browdy and uh, Marjorie Egan. We are talking about, is it day four? Yeah, day four of Donald Trump's trial. In theory, if the five alternates uh, uh, yet to be picked are picked today, the opening statements, incredibly, will be on Monday. And we're talking about your reaction to three and a quarter days of the first criminal trial of a former president in our history at 877-301-8970. Okay, we were asking how many people were paying big attention mm -hmm. to this and how many sure. weren't. Here's Brian from Marblehead. Trump's on trial? For what? <laughs> Where? I thought Biden had the impeachment trial. Was it the father or the son being impeached or was it both? Isn't it the Olympic trials? By the way, you're laughing at that. You didn't. You thought it was fine that at least a couple of jurors didn't have any idea that there were other criminal charges pending against Trump. I mean, really, what world are they in? They're not following the news. Three, yeah. of, them, three of them said they were not following the news. Juror 9 and 10 and um, 
11. But so you're okay with that? But you're 11, does not follow the news, but she watches late night comedy shows, which oh, that's is full fine. of that's plenty. stories about the news. So you're okay with them making a decision in the you most know, important criminal trial of our know, lifetime? Maybe America's lifetime? You know, I don't mean to sound like a know it all, but yeah. you know, I used to be a reporter coming trials. I heard trials, that. Yeah, I know that. And you would interview the jurors afterwards. And, and I, I found general juries are really impressive, whether they're people that never got out of high school or the people that went to college or their lawyers that are on this case. They take it very seriously. There's something very awesome about even the Superior Court, forget, you know, the, the Supreme Court, just a Superior Court case. You know, the, 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 the way the whole room is set up, the way you stand up for the judge, the way the decorum is enforced. The way you know, they, form- you've read the reporting. They say this courtroom is a dump. Well, you know that. It's listen, a dump. There was a courtroom in Chelsea. I remember going when I was a young reporter, and every time somebody went to the John, you'd hear the John flush right in the middle of the court <laughs> proceedings. So that was not exactly. And there was never enough toilet paper in the Suffolk. You know, you're, it was a big joke. You go to the Suffolk Superior bring Court downtown, bring your own toilet paper. There would never be enough. So a lot of them are physically decrepit. But there's still something about it that makes you feel kind of patriotic. It's kind of like, you know, when you get up at the beginning of a baseball game or a basketball game and do the national anthem. You know, there's a certain surge of patriotism that goes through you. And I think people do take it very seriously. Now, that doesn't mean they're... What are you talking on- about? The beginning of a baseball or football game, when they stand up through the national anthem, they're all drunk. <laughs> I mean... What are you talking Jim, about? you're just ruining, you're ruining the spirit? everything. You're ruining the spirit here. Okay, I think I'm generally sorry. speaking... Oh, that's great. I'm impressed too. Jurors are, are generally... I agree with that. I agree with that. ...well functioning. They're not corrupt for the most part, and they're not... Uh, they're serious about the for evidence. For the most part. Okay. <laughs> Andy and Sudbury, what's your deal? Well, I've been a criminal defense lawyer for 42 years. Whoa. And um, so I have a few things to say, first of all, about lawyers on juries. Um, because I have had many lawyers on many juries. Oh. And uh, quite frankly, I think the people out there need to know that lawyers have no standing to try to educate the jurors about anything. Lawyers are jurors like everyone else. Yeah, but doesn't mean they won't try to. to. The judge. What? Say what? Doesn't mean they won't try to. I agree. They're the same as everybody else on the jury. Oh, I disagree because I disagree because I think the lawyers want to shut them down because I think jurors don't want to hear the law from the lawyers. They want to hear the law from the judge. I hope you're right. And I think they follow the law given by the judge. So don't go away. If you had a juror, if you had a lawyer uh, on a, uh, in a jury pool and you had, you had challenge, peremptory cha- challenges left, would you not automatically use them to get rid of a lawyer? You're okay with lawyer? If the lawyer was in any one of a number of fields other than the prosecutor, okay, yeah. I would have no problem with wow. whoever. I don't prosecutors on my jury. I respect your position. You know but much any, more about the any other lawyer I could take because they're, they're in a different position. Got it. Doing a different kind of law. I got and it. Yet, I hear you. Andy, thanks for the call. We appreciate your perspective and your experience. Thanks. Uh, I have had someone that's texted me four times today saying that... Uh, the, it, we were past the statute of limitations on this case because Stormy Daniels had denied the affair over and over again. Yeah. Attorney Bryden, would you like to uh, address that? Would I like to address that? Mm-hmm. No. <laughs> okay. By the way, they're not, you know, you've been to many more trials. I mean, I actually did some jury trials, not terribly yep. well when I was a young lawyer kind of thing, but obviously not of this magnitude. The, uh, Michael Cohen is a convicted liar. Right. He's the chief yeah. witness. I mean, convicted, went to jail mm-hmm. for lying. Stormy Daniels has some problems too. Jurors generally overcome that, do they? Do they not? I mean, how many times have you seen acquittals in major cases because the primary witness against the defendant was not clean? I mean, I, I, prosecutors get great deference. It mm-hmm. seems to me sometimes too much deference. Don't you think that's the case? Yeah, well, I think sometimes the jury can't figure out which one is lying. I mean, it was a great case when I was young with these two, two guys who were both convicted. I, they were both on second-degree murder for one of them raped and killed a woman that lived on Commonwealth uh-huh. Avenue. She was a young nurse, uh-huh. two, 293 Commonwealth Avenue, I remember. And the jury couldn't tell if defendant number one was telling the truth or defendant number two was telling the truth. One told on the other. And uh, so they ended up, um, since the one who told, who squealed, who was to, to the cops, uh, was was a guilty second degree. He pled guilty to second uh-huh. degree, so he'd get out of jail 15, 25 uh-huh. years. They gave the second guy second degree, even though the judge said they couldn't do it. 
you know, because but, they it, couldn't tell who was lying. Yeah, but one of the threshold things is, uh, you know, Trump is, uh, their position is we didn't use this money to pay off anything. We were paying Cohen his fees or whatever they did. But they also said he never had sex with uh, Stormy Daniels. That's right. Not only is she going to say it, but uh, my understanding is the judge allows Karen McDougal, the former Playboy yeah. model, to come in and say, I had sex with him too. I think at the same place, by the way. Well, she was. And I got paid 100 grand. Yeah, they were going, they were involved for about 10 months, I think. Oh, yeah, they were? Stormy was a one night stand. Allegedly, Jim. I think you're supposed to say. McDougal was a long, uh, over true? a period, yeah. And uh, one of them was shortly after Melania gave birth. I know. Yeah. Is she going to be there? Uh, well, It's one thing not to be there at jury selection. She's going to be standing by her man on she Monday? Said she, she has said she thinks the trial is unfair. Disgrace, can, she said. We, we can all recall that after affair. this news broke about these various affairs, that uh, she wrote alone to the State of the Union address, oh, right. breaking that. protocol. And uh, I'm not sure if that was the point at which she swatted his hand away when he tried to hold her hand. Maybe that was earlier. Uh, she's kept a low profile. It's odd to have a defendant in court day after day after day with nobody from his family there. Well, son, I mean, the, the three, well, he has four kids, right? five kids. That we don't know about Barron, but the other four kids are pretty loyal. Three of them, at least, yeah. are pretty loyal. Why aren't Barron, they sitting Barron next Barron to the father? Well, I think they're keeping Barron under... I, I well, I mean the three that. older ones. I don't know. That's a very, well, Ivanka, Eric, Ivanka, Don Jr. Ivanka seems to be Ivanka. keeping out of the uh, second term, if there is one, of President Trump altogether. But she doesn't have to worry because her husband, you know, I love the fact that Hunter Biden is always getting uh, mm -hmm. Congress after Hunter Biden for uh, saying a couple of million here and there that he shouldn't have gotten. Meanwhile, we're almost up to a billion dollars for Jared Kushner, right? It's From all these companies <laughs> that he was managed to get involved with overseas, um, uh, Saudi companies, etc. When his father-in-law was president, you hear what of Ivanka States. said when she was asked about the trial yesterday? What'd you say? I don't even know that guy. I mean, that's, <laughs> she's doing what her father does about anybody he doesn't uh, like. Paul and Hingham. Hi, Paul. You're going to wrap this up, I think. Hi, Paul. Welcome. Yeah, hey, thanks for your time. Um, sure. Yeah, I feel more comfortable that uh, the situation is the hands of a jury because my own experience uh, sitting on juries is that there's a lot of common sense, that there's a consensus that's come to. And also, I have my own experience, unfortunately, in a well, courtroom. And just, well, there was a hearing. Somebody put a restraining order on me and committed fraud in the court, and I reacted to their... And the judge wouldn't, uh, because I didn't go in with an attorney, because yeah. I thought it was a big nothing burger, yeah. um, I wasn't able to submit evidence. And the judge had some really bizarre methods, and afterwards, so now I have to go. But my point is that I would have far rather had that in the hands. Well, first of all, I should have brought an attorney. But well, whatever. We other, don't need to know about your case, but go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, it's, it's fine. It's civil. But yeah. I thought to myself... You know, if this were in the hands of a jury of my peers, and I've served on juries and people with common sense, nothing like this would have happened. So I feel for our purposes and for the purposes of even Donald Trump that having a jury, there, there is kind of a lot of common sense that comes out. Well, of you're with Marjorie, and my, I have to say, even though I'm much more cynical about it, thanks for the call, Paul, I'm, I have only been on one jury, and uh, I would say the person who acted most irresponsibly actually was me, as I told you. I was a holdout, ended up totally screwing the defendant in a slip and fall. There was a retrial, and I thought she wasn't getting enough money, and they did a retrial, she got nothing. I really was a big help to her. But the other, I think it was the sixth person injury, the other five people acted really grown up and were as yeah. responsible as you and Paul are saying. And I told you the story before about how I was on a sixth person jury. Yeah. It was a drunk driving case, I yeah. think. And the evidence was overwhelming. We get back there, and, and within 15 minutes, five of the six say, you know, the guy did it. I mean, come on. It's, it's over. And the six guys, well, let's look at this. Let's look at the diagrams. Did he really come to a full stop? Or how many drinks? And you know why? Because he wanted, so. he wanted to get a free lunch. Because if you're a juror, you get free lunch during lunchtime. We time did the same thing. When you're waiting, when you're deliberating. So as soon as he got his turkey sandwich, that was it. Came back from lunch. Guys guilty. guilty. We all went home. <laughs> In any case, we're done. We're done. We are moving on. Okay, we get a real treat uh, coming up for Live Music Friday this Friday. And by the way, I, it, you can watch all this at YouTube.com com slash gbh news uh, where we are streaming live we have got gala lee uh G galen lee i sorry i pronounced that wrong and adrian and 
You're going to do this, Jim. And on to one. Thank you. With Berkeley's brand. We call them Galen and Adrian. <laughs> I think that's the safest way for yeah. us to proceed here. Um, yeah, it, with Galen and Adrian, with this incredible music, Berkeley's brand new music inclusion ensemble. You're going to love every minute of this. They are up next. You're listening to Boston Public Radio 89.7 GBH, broadcasting live from the Boston Public Library and streaming at youtube.com slash GBH News. I'm Jared Bowen. Coming up on The Culture Show, our Arts and Culture Week in Review, live from the GBH studio at the Boston Public Library. First up, the Venice Biennale. It's simmering with political tensions, complaints that it's featuring too many dead artists, and a huge pile of dirt, corpse-like figures, and a space odyssey and vibe make the German pavilion a hit. Plus, we'll remember Faith Ringgold, the innovative artist who explored black life and history. It's all here on The Culture Show, today at 2 on 89.7 GBH. Our programs are made possible thanks to you and the Office of the Massachusetts State Treasurer. The Unclaimed Property Division is holding unclaimed funds from medical bills, uncashed paychecks, savings accounts, and more. To see if you have unclaimed money, you can visit findmassmoney.gov. And Medtronic. Using a data-driven approach to healthcare from AI to robotics, Medtronic is harnessing technology to help build a healthier future. Learn more at medtronic.com slash what's next. China's secret police, the Ministry of State Security, or MSS, has stepped up the number of raids and detentions to quell espionage suspicions. I know my wife well enough to know we are married for eight years, and we have no secrets, and she is not a spy. I'm Elsa Chang. A Chinese-American family is trapped in a web of MSS accusations. Next time on All Things Considered from NPR News. Today at 4, here on GBH News 89.7. Welcome back to Boston Public Radio. She's Mark Grieg and I'm Jim Browdy. Believe me, they're not applauding for us, they're applauding for what you're about to hear. Live from the Boston Public Library, streaming at youtube.com slash GBHUs. Mark and I, our, my motto is, when the world is collapsing, pray for Live Music Friday, and it is here. You may remember Adrian Anantuan was on our show. He was promoting his group Shelter Music Boston, bringing classical arts to homeless shelters around the city. You may also remember his performances, not one, but two Olympic opening ceremonies, Athens and Vancouver. As if that wasn't enough, Adrian's now the founder of the brand new Music Inclusion Ensemble, a collection of Berkeley students and faculty demonstrating the innovation and commitment to craft involved with performing as an artist with disabilities. Their first ever concert is tomorrow, that's Saturday, April 20th, at Berkeley's David Friend Recital Hall, featuring two highly acclaimed non-Berkeley performers. One is composer Molly Joyce, the other is the woman here with us to perform right now, the incredible Galen Lee, winner of NPR's 2016 Tiny Desk Concert, co-founder of the Disabled Artist Advocacy Group, which we're gonna talk about, called Ramped. She's open for acts like Wilco, in addition, this is unreal, to composing the music for Daniel Craig, who Marjorie thinks is very sexy, his Broadway revival of Macbeth, 
For information, tomorrow's performance is free. You can go to Galen's website, violinscratches.com, click the calendar tab for more info. We're going to talk to them in a couple of seconds, but first, we are thrilled they're going to play for us. They'll be performing. I wait. Welcome to you all. things together. We're going to start in a second or two here. I wait. Inclusion Ensemble. We'll tell you more information about tomorrow night in a few minutes. Uh, uh, and the song was I Wait. We're joined now by Adrian Anantawan, who is, uh, we've been lucky enough to have on the show in the past. And we're meeting for the first time, Galen Lee. Your voice is surreal, Galen, I should say. <laughs> it's thrilling to meet you. Welcome thank to you, you both. And thank you, all of your colleagues as well. Well, thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you so much for being here, Gail. So tell us first, what is the deal? What's the ensemble? Tell us about this ensemble. Well, this is Adrian's brainchild. Um, it's a way to kind of highlight the culture of disability and the music that we create, not despite our disabilities, but because of who we are. Like that song you just heard is a disability rights anthem, kind of like a call to action. And so um, just kind of broadcasting that there are some really great artists with disabilities that um, deserve a place in the cultural landscape, and that's what Adrian's doing with this ensemble. You know, you are one hell of an entrepreneur there, Adrian. I should say, I mean, every time you're on here, there is some incredibly creative thing that came out of your head. What was the genesis of this for you? I think that, for me, the idea of growing up with a difference myself and really having to assimilate within the classical music culture was something that... I was successful at, and I think I'm at a spot in my career right now to really centralize my disability, essentially, 
And I think that the more that we can do this together with other musicians across the world who have these types of differences, the more we can amplify our voices and really shift culture in a positive way. And how accepting do you find the uh, world that loves music and the arts to be? I think that in the end, it just really depends on how you frame that type of piece of music, for instance, or maybe even an ensemble as well. I think that in the end, uh, it can vary quickly shift to a pity case or you're only inspirational as musicians because you mm -hmm. have this difference in disability. Uh, for us, it's really just thinking about how we share collective stories that are complex because no disability is a monolith, for uh -huh. instance. We have uh, many different types of disabilities, invisible and uh, visible in this very ensemble. Well, Galen, tell us about uh, recording artists and music professionals with disabilities or ramped. What is it, and how long has it been around? Yeah, um, Ramped is an organization that I helped to found. I co-founded it with a singer out in New York City named Lachi, and we started talking about how it was kind of alienating. Being a professional musician with a disability, there are not a lot of supports built into the music industry yet. A lot of venues aren't really accessible. A lot of managers and booking agents don't really understand what goes behind the scenes to make a show accessible and a tour accessible. So we, we thought, why don't we create a professional organization sort of modeled after the Recording Academy specifically for professional disabled artists so that they feel a sense of community and also so that our collective voices are louder together. You know, we have, we've been able to do consulting work with places like the Recording Academy to just start inserting that conversation of disability into the DEI discussion, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, bringing disability on board, not just as a cultural piece, but as a piece of accessibility as well. You better work fast before they outlaw DEI there, Gail. Let me <laughs> tell you. <laughs> Gail, how, how, success, how much has your collective voice, as you describe it, been heard, do you think, so far? I think it's changing really fast. I mean, I do think there's, we have a long way to go before uh, the music industry is really totally inclusive or accessible or celebratory, which is what I want to see, a disability celebrated as a part of culture. But even since I started touring after the Tiny Desk, I've seen a lot of positive changes. Venues not just asking, but actually doing uh, when we make recommendations of what will make this show more accessible. And places just being open to learning. I think you can't start with action unless you have the foundation of learning underneath it. And I think we're in the learning phase and, I, and we're getting into action and I just really want to see that continue. And what will help is other artists without disabilities mm. joining the cause to make the music industry more accessible because it shouldn't just be up to disabled artists. It should be part of everybody's collective responsibility. That's the voice of Galen Lee and she's joined by Adrian and Antoine. We're going to introduce their colleagues in a second. Tomorrow night their music uh, inclusion ensemble will be performing and we'll give you information on how to get there again in a minute. It's just, Galen, you mentioned the Tiny Desk uh, contest and I think there were 6,000 entries and you beat them all. You won, you won. So tell people what that is. It's an NPR thing. Yeah. And, and what that meant to your career. I mean, it was huge. It's a national public radio like annual contest and you enter a YouTube video. Mine was recorded on a crappy phone. It was the worst <laughs> video in the world, but the song is what they're looking at and I couldn't believe when I won and it just really launched my career, not just musically, but uh, activism wise into a national and international space and it was a really huge deal. So I encourage any aspiring artist to just join every year. It's a great opportunity. Adrian, do you want to uh, introduce your uh, fellow musicians here? Sure, yeah. We have uh, Zainab here, who is a student at Berkeley. Hi, Zainab. Uh, Hector, uh, our cellist, uh, Connor, our violist, and we have a very special guest, Kira from uh, San Diego. Uh, Kira reached out to me about 11 months ago uh, she had gotten into an accident where uh, she lost uh, two of her fingers, had one uh, reattached. And it's an incredible story of resilience for her because she lost these fingers on her left hand. So she's relearned the vi viola over the last like several months backwards and has a prosthetic for her bow hand. So oh. this is really one of her first performances, public performances, uh, and we were just so grateful. Like we think about acquired disabilities and, and your life can change in a moment and uh, she's responded with such uh, creativity and grace. Kira, is that your mother? 
By the way, Kira's mother's here. This is maybe the proudest woman I have ever seen. Is that a, say, a fair assumption? Yes, it is. Okay, fine. I'm well, sorry, you know, Marjorie. I, I was just going to say, I, I think there's a, lot of, there's a lot of ignorance about the disabled community. People that are, are, are not dealing with disabilities don't think about them. So mm -hmm. I can imagine you must have encouraged, uh, encountered a lot of discouragement uh, in your career. Talk about that. Sure. So I would say that discouragement really came upon the idea of not knowing how to help in the right way. Yeah. So for instance, my music teacher all wanted us to play the recorder, but that was inherently an inaccessible instrument. Uh, the same with like our composer, uh, Molly Joyce, who acquired a disability all of a sudden, and she was forced to maybe try to play uh, something that wasn't really in tune with her body. Mm. And I think that uh, the incredible thing about music is that uh, we are really uh, resisting those narratives of ignorance uh, and really showing as purely as possible a human expression that really goes beyond our physical selves by, in fact, embracing our physical differences. Well, you just talked about adapting the, the violin. I mean, Galen, you are playing a violin in a way that is not normally played. Tell us, for those who can't see us here or not on YouTube, how, how do you sort play the violin? Sort of cello-esque, right? Yeah, I play it a lot like a, uh, a cello, a mini cello up yeah. in front of me, and then I hold my bow like a bass player does. And so um, that was a um, music teacher and I kind of worked together to find a method that worked. And, um, you know, the, the initial idea didn't take long, but then the refining of it over the years um, has gotten better and better. And now I've been playing for 30 years, so it feels second nature. And I, I think any music teacher with a little creativity is... Um, able to do that kind of thinking. They just have to be open to reworking technique for that body that they're, uh, for that person and their mind. Um, and I think it's possible for a lot more people than currently uh, are getting helped to learn. Okay, Galen, you don't know how superficial Marjorie and I, I am. are because you're on our show. I'm about so to be very superficial. I'm going to play a little sound. This is you playing the witch theme for Macbeth and Marjorie oh. has a question for you. Here <laughs> yes. it is. Here's Galen playing the witch theme. Go ahead, Marjorie. Okay, well, we just, we just want to know, Galen, at least I want to know. <laughs> you wrote the music for Macbeth, starring yes. Daniel Craig. Many people know Daniel Craig, who's one of the many James Bonds, an incredi incredibly uh, handsome James Bond. <laughs> so I just wonder if you have any good stories about working with Daniel Craig on Macbeth. I mean, he was really nice. Uh, he just loves theater. He was just really excited to be there. He just tried to, like, fit in. He, like socialize with everyone. He was just a really nice person. I, it's kind of funny because I'm going to be honest, I didn't know who he was when I got asked <laughs> to do the show. And so I felt good not feeling too nervous around him because I had very little frames of reference, which is a shame to the rest of the world, but that's the truth. <laughs> you, know, you guys are going to play again in a second. Just one last question for you before yeah. Adrian introduces the last uh, item you're going to play. <laughs> I read, heard you saying on some interview today, so excited when you're asked what a disability is like, and the answer is not negative. How, how close are we to that place, do you think? I think that having disabled people do what we're doing right now, playing on the radio in front of people, is how we're going to get there. I think people just need to see and have it be normalized and have it be better understood. So we're on our way. And I think the one thing that I would encourage everybody here, everybody listening to do, is to think about somebody that you know with a disability. Because I think sometimes we other, we other it and we say, well, that doesn't apply to me. But if you love someone with a disability, you should care about disability. If you know someone at work, that's, you know, then that's part of your life too. So I think we're getting there. And I think we just got to keep having conversations like this. So uh, Adrian, what are you, Galen, and your colleagues going to be playing? We're going to be playing Someday Will Linger in the Sun. Uh, this piece is very solemn, sweet, and just mentions and talks about that love that uh, we have for our community, for ourselves, and uh, one of the many pieces that we'll be playing tomorrow night at David Friend. Fabulous. Why don't you join your colleagues? Thank Marge, you. do you want to tell people how to get there? Uh, yeah, the concert is tomorrow night at Berkeley's David Friend Recital Hall. Performance is free. You can go to Galen's website, violinscratches.com, violinscratches.com, and click the calendar tab for more information about the concert. Again, it's tomorrow. Berkeley's uh, David Friend Recital Hall, free. 
go to Galen's website. And by the way, Galen is spelled G-A-E-L-Y-N-N, Galen's website, violinscratches.com. And here they are again, the music inclusion ensemble playing Someday Will Linger in the Sun. Listening to violinist Galen Lee alongside Adrian oh. and Nanjuan and players from the brand new music inclusion ensemble. For more information on their concert tomorrow at Berkeley's David Friend Recital Hall performances free, go to Galen's website, violinscratches.com. That's violinscratches.com for more information. Coming up. That after was spectacular. Spectacular. Thank you all. That Coming was up just after the new news, GBH's Callie Crossy is here. You're listening to Boston Public Radio.
Support for our programs comes from you and BioNova Scientific, a biologics CDMO providing development and GMP manufacturing services to small and mid-sized biopharmaceutical companies. BioNova Scientific, where concept becomes cure. BioNovaScientific.org. I'm associate digital producer Elena Eberwine, and you and I are listening to 89.7 WGBH HD1 Boston, online at gbhnews.org. GBH News with NPR. What matters to you? I'm Jim Bradley, ahead on Boston Public Radio, live from the Boston Public Library. We'll start the noon hour with GBH's Callie Crossley on tennis star Serena Williams' new fund to improve maternal health care, the drama inside NPR, and more. Then it's GBH executive arts editor and host of the Culture Show, Jared Bowen, on a new musical lighting up the Boston theater scene and the biggest art fraud ever. I'm Marjorie Egan. This weekend, the Literary Lights Dinner will celebrate the best of local writing, including legendary sports columnist from the Globe, Dan Shaughnessy. We'll talk with him and former host of Only a Game, Bill Littlefield. Live from NPR News in Washington, I'm Lakshmi Singh. A $95 billion foreign aid package for Israel, Ukraine and other security priorities is heading for a final vote in Congress. House Speaker Mike Johnson saw a series of bills clear a procedural hurdle today after Democrats helped him overcome opposition from dozens of hardline Republicans. A short time ago, Johnson told reporters that the package is the best the GOP could secure under the circumstances. We look forward to the vote tomorrow. Uh, we let, look forward to every member voting their conscience and, and their desire. And that is exactly how this process is supposed to work and how the House is supposed to operate. The package includes $26 billion for Israel, $61 billion for Ukraine, $8 billion for the Indo-Pacific. It also includes a TikTok ban measure. U.S. officials confirm an Israeli military strike against Iran overnight, the latest in a recent series of retaliatory attacks between the two. That includes Iran's unprecedented drone and missile strike against Israel last weekend. NPR's Peter Kenny reports one Israeli cabinet minister says he was underwhelmed by his country's latest response to Iran. Iran's state-affiliated news agency Tasneem quoted the one-word social media post by Israeli National Security Minister Itamar Ben-Gavir in which he described Israel's apparent response to a purported barrage fired by Iran as feeble. Tasneem commented that the authorities in Israel are making fools of themselves. Meanwhile, Israeli opposition leader Yair Lapid was also harsh in his criticism of Ben Gavir's post, saying that with an unforgivable tweet of one word, Ben Gavir manages to smear and embarrass Israel from Tehran to Washington. Peter Kenyon, NPR News, Jerusalem. The Biden administration has announced new regulations around handling sexual misconduct cases on campus. NPR Stovia Smith reports the new rules extend Title IX protections against sex discrimination to include sexual orientation and gender identity and they roll back some changes made by the Trump administration. Under the new rules, in-person court-like proceedings on sexual misconduct, including cross-examination of alleged victims, are no longer required. And while regulations created under the Trump administration narrowed what counts as sexual harassment, the Biden regs loosen that back up. They also extend Title IX to cover pregnant, gay, and trans students. Catherine Lehman is Assistant Secretary for Civil Rights. Title IX requires more. And these final regulations provide it. Critics say the new rules violate the due process rights of the accused. And Republican Congresswoman Virginia Fox said it, quote, dumps kerosene on an already raging fire related to transgender students' rights. But an even more contentious issue remains to be addressed. That is, whether schools can ban transgender athletes. Tovia Smith, NPR News. Former President Donald Trump's back in court for the fourth day of his criminal trial in New York for falsifying internal business records when he was running for president in 2016. It's NPR News. Good afternoon. With the latest from the GBH Newsroom, I'm Henry Santoro. The Norfolk Superior Court murder trial of Karen Reed is off until Monday when jury selection will resume. The third day of the trial ended yesterday without a full impaneled jury. Two jurors were added yesterday, four more needed before the opening statements and testimony can begin. The trial began with jury selection last uh, this past Tuesday, and as of yesterday, there were 12 people impaneled, but they're off until
until Monday. Federal grand jury has indicted a 35-year-old man on a charge that he set fire to the door of U.S. Senator Bernie Sanders. history of mental illness, including a recent hospitalization. Law enforcement officials have not indicated any potential motive for the alleged arson. Federal prosecutors say Sagamonian allegedly sprayed a liquid on the door of Sanders' office in downtown Burlington and then lit the door on fire. There were multiple people in Sanders' office when the fire started, though no one was injured. For the New England News Collaborative, I'm Liam Elder Connors. 53 degrees in Boston. This is GBH News. Support for NPR comes from NPR stations. GBH News. We want to tell you again about a special uh, BPR edition. It's going to be at UMass Boston over in Dorchester. He's going to be elevated. We're going to be there for his elevation uh, to Chancellor over there at UMass. So that's a big deal. If you're in the neighborhood or you're not in the neighborhood, come by University Hall. Uh, it'd be a great day. One last thing. Uh, I know this music inclusion ensemble had a profound impact on people here, and I assume people listening or watching at home. They're at Berkeley tomorrow night. One more time. Tickets are free, but you go to Violin Scratches, ES, dot com. I would not miss it. They were extraordinary, to say the least. We're joined now at the desk by GBH's Kelly Crossley. Kelly's the host of Under the Radar with Kelly Crossley. You can catch that Sunday nights right here at 89, 7, and 6. You can also hear her Kelly commentaries on Mondays for GBH's Morning Edition. She's also the co-host for GBH's The Culture Show. It airs 2 o'clock right here in 89, 7. And as I hope you know, today, Fridays, it is live at the Boston Public Library immediately following our show. Hello, Kelly Crossley. Hello. Hey there. Hello, Kelly Crossley. Hey. Hello. So let's start with um, a lot of colleges cracking down on student protests. Uh, a lot of them have, have happened, obviously, since the terrorist attack by Hamas on October 7th. There's been uh, pro-Israeli uh, demonstrations. There have been pro-Palestinian uh, uh, demonstrations. The president, we're going to play a little sound here, actually, the president of Columbia University. She was the latest uh, college president hauled in before Congress to talk about anti-Semitism on campus. Uh, here is Nimet Savak, uh, Shavik's uh, congressional testimony asking about how chants like from the river to the sea make her feel and whether they violate Columbia's policies. I find those chants incredibly distressing and I wish profoundly that people would not use them on our campus. I think one of the issues that we are actively debating now and which is to actually clarify where language crosses the line from protected speech to discriminatory or harassing speech. And since she called the cops on protesters in Columbia, I guess she thinks that the protesters there crossed the line. What do you make of all this? Well, first of all, let's, <clears throat> let's know that that was the first time in 50 years that um, any president of Columbia has called cops onto the campus to deal with student protesters. I think that what you have, and let me, let me um, background and, 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 and put this in context. So I'm speaking from a former college protester's viewpoint, you know? And You're also I, on the board of trustees of a prominent of, college right down the road. That Wellesley. would be Wellesley College, yeah. the preeminent women's college in the Excuse world. Excuse me, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I, sorry. sorry. I forgot that part. <laughs> you yeah. should have added that. <laughs> yes, you should have. So, um, and I just had uh, an experience two weeks ago on campus at Wellesley when 
Secretary, former Secretary Clinton was there for a summit about leadership in, um, connected to her, her new center. And there were protesters outside, quite loud, quite vigorous. I did not interact with them, but some of my other colleagues did and classmates. Uh, but inside, there was a program, um, as it turned out, by certain students, you know, every few minutes or every certain half hour or something, somebody would jump up and start you know, screaming, um, all kinds of things. I have to say, the first two, I thought, eh, just disruptive. The last person, still very disruptive, but, you know, I sort of registered the pain and the anger of, of the person. Now, please be clear, she's screaming, and Secretary Clinton tries to say, hey, I will talk to you afterwards, I'm just not gonna engage in screaming. So if we wanna have a dialogue, let's have a dialogue, and I'm, I'm happy to do that. Um, the moderator, who's a young woman from WMUR, said the same thing because she's, this was about Hamas and the Palestinian um, a situation which has left so many people on very rigid sides, as you know. Um, and so she said, my family's Palestinian, so I, I you know, have some empathy from where you're, said, you don't know what you're talking about, you don't want to uh, talk about. And, uh, so that plus hearing from some of my classmates about going outside to actually talk to the, 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 the um, protesters outside, when she said, hey, this used to be me, can we have a conversation about where you're at and maybe how we can negotiate a conversation for the campus, blah, 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 screamed in her face, said, if you're going into this thing, you're evil. And so I was left with uh, this, the piece by the New York Times going to Dr. Dia Meyer, who's the chancellor of Vanderbilt and his quote, and he says, they're not interested in dialogue. When they are invited for dialogue, they do not participate. So that's one thing. Uh, and that's but having said that, yeah. protesters yeah. have oh. no obligation well, to engage I, in dialogue. I was about that's, to finish, okay. Okay. I'm saying, but my recollection of our self-righteous selves when we protested was, we, and I, I will call me out, we had an ask at the end of it. We want this, we want to talk. Didn't, doesn't mean we got it, but, but there was an intention of some kind of dialogue, okay? Um, so there is that. Then you have to understand that a campus is a place where you're supposed to have vigorous debate that sometimes is uncomfortable and not good. And you know, yes, we argue about what that should be and what it should look like, where campus uh, presidents um, and leaders have to worry about is, where does this push over into violence? We've just done this GBH poll where an amazing number of people, adults, said they expected to have political violence in this coming up election. In that environment, we should not be surprised that this is spilling on over to campuses and that therefore leaves the campuses in a particularly weird position because you want discussion you want vigorous discussion, sometimes you want heated discussion, but you have to make a call at some point about when is this gonna go yeah. over to where people are going to be harmed and are they, is it happening now and how do I respond to it? So here we have the Columbia president saying, I can't deal with it anymore, we're calling cops in. And then the other side of me, I know I'm talking on and on about no, this, but, I've, but I really have thought about this, keeps going back to the vision of Kent State and the image of those protesters, those students, if people don't know it, and the cops were called in, and people ended up dead. Now, listen, <laughs> there's a lot going on in that scenario as well, but there's all of that to consider, and it's very, so I would say it's, it's frightening, um, it's debilitating, and yet um, the campuses still are gonna have to try to figure out how to accommodate both protest and Safety. I agree with all that. Okay. Let me just say a couple okay. things. I don't know nearly as much about this as you do. I did research the Columbia thing, but there's also that piece in the Times you mentioned saying it's not just Columbia, there are a ton of colleges right. cracking down who hadn't in the past. One, if there is not violence, the notion that a college all of a sudden for the first time at Columbia right. is calling in the cops to me is totally across the line. Okay, Students but pause there. Suspended. Remember they had lit fires. Yeah. So. Do you I hear consider you. that I hear you. I've, I There have been fires lit before. I don't know if I do. I wasn't uh, there. I'm okay. just saying there was All no right. violence okay. threatened against anybody else that I'm aware <clears> of. <throat> number, number two, I don't know if it's coincidental or not, and maybe, again, you're on a board of trustees. Mm. I've never been, thankfully, for the organization. <laughs> uh, 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 there are a spate, all of a sudden, of mm. crackdowns on protests on colleges, which I don't remember for decades and decades. And the question is, for me, is it coincidental that 
the vast majority of the protests that are being cracked down are people protesting not in favor of Hamas, we should be clear, right. but in favor of innocent Palestinians who are getting murdered. And I, I and, and plus, third, hmm. Congress, the Republicans in the House are deeply right. involved. Donors are really unhappy, yes, like the are. infamous donor at Harvard. And I just hope that this does not signal a new trend because college presidents are scared of Republicans in Congress and major donors to their organizations. Well, Other than I, that, I don't disagree with anything. I said. think that's a, that those are all valid points. I would argue that there has always been uh, some kind of attempt to push back on protesters, having been on the end of the pro on the protesting end. I remember the 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 administration saying, "I'm sorry." No, you're not going to do this. Your point is, if the policy is changing about how they will respond, and we in this New York Times piece, what we saw is that some colleges have decided to adapt their policy. Now, to your point, is that driven by what you just said? I can't answer that I question. I don't know yet either. You know, and so this is something we'll be watching to see. And here's the thing. The students that are on these campuses are pretty darn smart. Um, so they will be pointing it out to us if they can see evidence of that as well. But right now, I'm, I'm just really very, very concerned about where is the line to protect students' physicality, because I am worried about that. I, I, I'm, I couldn't I'm, agree with you more. Talking to Callie Crossley. You know, um, this next piece about this birth fund, um, and you're going to mm. tell us about it in mm. a second, but just before you tell us about it, it, it drives me insane when we have this conversation across the country about abortion, but we don't talk about adequate health care for mm -hmm. the women who are having babies. Mm -hmm. We never talk about the fathers mm -hmm. who, who, if so many women weren't in poverty, and that's the number one reason for abortion, they wouldn't be having abortions. Mm -hmm. And we never talk about the, the government going after any of these deadbeat dads mm -hmm. that, that aren't paying their money. But anyway, uh, tell us about this birth fund, which is great, but I, this should be... Everybody's. Standard operating procedure, but tell us about it. So um, it's Black Maternal Health Week, and um, author and journalist Elaine Welteroth, if people are fans of Project Runway, she's a judge on that show, um, along with tennis champion Serena Williams and others, um, have, have bonded together to form this, this initiative called Birth Fund, which essentially is putting together funds for people who, um, with an emphasis on African American women, because the studies show it's the the rates are really horrible in terms of of having an excellent birth or the chances of having an excellent birth. So they're trying to remove the financial barriers and expand access access specifically to midwifery care, which, as as the studies are showing. Um, seems to be a way to at least ameliorate some of the issues that women find when they uh, go to end up in the hospitals. They're just not listened to by doctors. I mentioned Serena Williams because if you don't know, when she had her first child, she kept saying, something is wrong. wrong. I know my body. Who wouldn't know their body better than, than this, Serena this Williams. athlete? <laughs> and they kept saying to her, no, 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 no. And she almost died. That's not a, that's not a hype. That is... That's yep. on the record. So she's very much involved in this. And this um, is something that Elaine thought about after she had, she did not have a bad experience. She was able to make it through with, you know, having her child and then thought about the cost and the other people who were not as fortunate as she. So this is an incredible, um, because it's, it's the kind of monies that usually don't get covered by funding. Yeah. You know, it falls through the cracks. You're like, maybe we can make sure that this program can do this. But then you're just like, well, how do I get to the program? Or how do I you know, pay for the meds to allow me to... It's all these kinds of things that'll be, um, that'll be uh, cared for, that, that women will be allowed to be cared for in this way because of this fund. So good for them. It also, they want to use it to raise, um, raise uh, awareness about this ongoing issue because it Can is Can I read ongoing. a few statistics yeah. that you yeah. uh, yes. touched on? This mm -hmm. is, uh, again, we're in the wealthiest country in the world. Yeah. The United States has the highest rate of maternal mortality in the world. Black women are three times more likely to die in childbirth than non-black mothers. And the, w the World Health Organization reports that midwifery, is that how you say it? Yes. yes. Midwifery yes. care could avert more than 80% mm -hmm. of the maternal deaths, stillbirths, and neonatal deaths. So this thing is literally a life and death kind of deal. You know, I've watched so many documentaries and read so much work about this. And one that just sticks with me um, called Aftershock, actually, which was produced by Spike Lee's wife, oh. I had to 
you know, mention this. Uh, but one of the scenes in the, in the documentary is from uh, uh, one of the experts saying, you know, it's really an issue of time. And if you're in the hospital, time is money. Mm -hmm. And they don't have time for you, yeah. woman, to have a natural birth. But yet, if you just let it evolve many times, whatever will go away. You're rushing the woman through the process and that's where a lot of issues happen. And they showed this incredible scene of this woman, hours and hours and hours of you know midwife care as she just waited for the process and then had a healthy baby. And they compared it to how much time she would have been given had she made it to the hospital. And there was no comparison. She would have been out the door. Well, you, <laughs> you know, you know it, it just a, a little personal story. I went to the Brigham and Women's midwife service for my first kid mm -hmm. and the reason I did it is because if you go to the midwife you, you meet with every one of the different well there's four of them when I did it mm -hmm. so you meet with every one of them your appointment so what happens to most women that get to the hospital some stranger is there delivering the baby because their obstetrician is not usually on call and if it's your first baby second baby third baby you've done it you know the drill yeah. but the first ba baby is really yeah. scary yeah. and to have people that you know and as you say that are going to give you the time uh, I, and I explain to you what's happening along the way. Explain to you what's <laughs> happening. Now, I remember them saying to me, you know, if you're going to wash a dryer, now, many, most fish are not going to ask you that, but she mm -hmm. said, you know, you might think about that because you're going to have a lot of laundry to do, and right. who's going to come help you? Right. Is your mother coming? Is your husband going to be there? Is your partner going to be there? All these things about your life. And I just thought, you know, for women that are pregnant that, or are thinking about getting pregnant, the midwife service, I'm, they're all over the place, but the one at the Brigham was great. And... Um, it eases a lot of your anxiety. And obviously results in healthier you know, outcomes. Um, I hate when I uh, just did what I did. The woman has a name, Tanya Lewis Lee, yeah. <laughs> is the, the producer of this film. She happens to be married to Spike Lee, but that's not the point. So, yeah. Um. yeah, well, it, 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 good for Serena Williams yeah. and Elaine Wel Welchroff for doing this. I mean, you know, it's great. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Uh, Cal, no, I'm sorry. I didn't know. Mm. I thought you were finished your sentence. Can we say, you know, one of the things, I know I speak for Marjorie, Friday nights were amongst my favorite times when there was a show mm. on Channel <laughs> 2 that you were on every yes. Friday, hosted by our buddy yes. Emily Rooney, mm -hmm. Beat the Press. And if there was ever a time, oh, Marjorie God. and I were talking about this, yeah. where we were saying, do we need a beat? And we mm. love Adam's show on mm. politics, by the way. Can you spend a couple of minutes describing to people what this mess is that's at NPR? generated by a piece written by now a former 25-year editor at National Public Radio and what's going on and what's your thoughts right. on? Right. I don't know how to pronounce his first name. Is it Yuri? I think it's Yuri, I but think I'm it's not Yuri, sure. So U-R-I. Yuri, Yuri Berliner um, was on the uh, business desk for many years, senior editor, um, uh, said he, we know, a part of of the NPR movement, felt very good about the work that NPR was doing, and then felt... Um, some years ago that NPR lost its way and he had very specific critiques. He felt that there was not enough discussion about some of the issues of the day which did not, in his opinion, um, get the diverse opinion of thought applied to the discussion as much as he thought. He then gave some examples, one of them that stuck out to me because my sources uh, got back to me on this, uh, said there were um, 87 Democrats at one point working with him and zero Republicans. Now let me just pause and say, um, there was actually a black Republican working with him, my sources tell me, so maybe black Republicans don't count, or maybe, as Steve Inskeep wrote in a response to his thing about the errors, the many errors in his original essay, that was one of them. <laughs> um, um, and so, uh, it, you know, as many people have said who you know, felt like he attacked them without the foundational, the, the, the expert foundational correct information to do so, um, said, you know, you, we can always take a criticism. We can all take criticism. We can all re-look at what we're going to do. But hey, if you're going to do it, B, make sure all your facts are right as you make your case, and his were, were not. By the way, if you read the Berliner yeah. piece, which I think most of us have, at least those who work here, you really do have to read Inskeep's response. Yeah. I think it's Inskeep great. is beyond yeah. yep. reproach, and he says, as you touched upon, that this that his line was, uh, Yuri needed an editor. Right. Uh, that it is riddled with mistakes. You know, one of the other issues, and, and make your up your own mind, we're going to talk more about this in the days ahead. One other thing, uh, uh, the guy who, uh, Rufo, 
who uh, spends a lifetime sort of, uh, I mean, I think he was involved in the Claudine right. Gay thing and her right. plagiarism and, uh, and finding that. I found some old uh, tweets that have been deleted mm -hmm. by the brand new uh, uh, president CEO. of, uh, yeah. CEO, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, of uh, mm -hmm. NPR, mm -hmm. including one that referred to Donald Trump as a, a deranged racist. Mm -hmm. And it's been deleted, and the defense from NPR is that was her, you know, she was in the private sector, she mm -hmm. wasn't doing this, she wasn't a journalist at the time. What's your reaction? And now she's head of NPR. What's your reaction to that? Well, I, th I mean, we've had many discussions about how these old tweets pop up and, you know, kill people in their in their new positions. I mean, all we can do is, you know, take her response as it will, and, and NPR has to decide whether or not that's damaging. I, I mean, the, the underpinning of all of this, you know, as a, as a conversation, as a controversy, of course, is those same uh, conservative voices that have said, it's about time these campuses crack down on these, you know, <laughs> protesters are the same people saying, I told you so, I told you so. See this guy from the inside, the call came from inside the house. We're telling you yeah. this is what's happening. So, um, you know, that gives, that's fodder for them to say whatever. Now, could we look around and find many people uh, coming from their side that had, yes, we could, but NPR has to decide as an institution if that's okay. But, um, you, but you know what I think is, and I've said this before, mm -hmm. but that we haven't figured out what to do with Donald Trump. I mean, it's not we like the media. The media yes. yes. It's not like, you know, right. Obama running against Romney. Okay, you agree with Obama, you agree with Romney. They're, they're not right. crazy people. You know, they're, they're regular, po or Bush versus Kerry. You may not have liked George Bush. Or like hell bent on destroying democracy. Yeah. I mean, now, right. it, so we have this guy now, you know, who's uh, 24 women plus accused him of these sexual improprieties. He's on tr trial uh, now for tr hush payments. He's accused of trying to overthrow an mm -hmm. election. I mean, he's, he's liable civilly, at least for rape. I mean, somebody who's way off in, in crazy land. And so we couldn't even decide to call him a liar right. until many months into his term. So I think we don't know what to do because I have never been this... Um, attacking of a person in office in my life is there we've never done that actually, no in our 25 yeah. until years. he right. came never. along right. and so i think that's part of the the issue I well think. that's the that's certainly the environment i mean but i want to say you know both things can be true you know this guy whether he has a flawed opinion or not can have can offer up some conversation that needs to be discussed mm -hmm. internally and at the same time can have an essay that's riddled with errors that doesn't help his case <laughs> You know, yeah. in the same way that her past tweets, current president, uh, CEO of NPR, don't help her. And what you have to decide always is to see, well, what is the pattern of behavior that's attached to that, um, which determines whether that's had an impact on actually the editorial content. She would argue no. First of all, she just got there. Um, and so now people are on alert, if you will. Okay, we only have a minute mm -hmm. left, but I, you can't miss this cultural moment. At midnight last night and 2 a.m., 31 new songs by, what's that woman's name, that singer? <laughs> Taylor Swift. Taylor Swift, yeah, right. Never Torture heard of her. Poets Department. <laughs> Here is cut number five, which is allegedly always the most significant, So Long London. It's about some guy I never heard of. She was dating for so we went for six years. You doing this today or you're not doing this? Yeah, of course we oh, are doing course, this. It's called the Culture Show. Okay, so you're not going to tell us anything. Is that the bottom line? That's pretty much it. Okay. okay. Fine. Well, you know, one of the lyrics of this new album has "The love of my life versus the love that I lost" or something like that. So, where were we with Travis? Well, Have but, we investigated this? But, but you know, the history of 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 her of her lyrics are that she always involves always. Her, the ex boyfriend. I love yeah. That. So y'all can. You know, try to decide that all along. You're supposed at to one say point. tune in at two o'clock, but that's yeah, okay. Yeah. What are you, you doing know, Sunday night? I personally think she and Travis are cute together. I uh, do Sunday, too. Sunday, Sunday night, um, we, uh, I am doing a um, LGBTQ roundtable, and we're talking about the $850,000 worth of funding that Ayanna Presley and and uh, Senator Warren and Senator Markey made sure happened for uh, this new development called the Pride, which will be, I believe, the first in this nation specifically address senior housing, LGBTQ senior housing, because it's a real issue for elders who are in that community. And we're also just on the fun side talking about this Boston.com article that 
uh, is assessing what is the star neighborhood now. Uh, oh. It's apparently Dorchester. You can listen <laughs> in to find out why. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And on the second part of the show, we're doing the exhibit at the MFA called Hallie You, uh, talking with both the curator and, and a Korean uh, social expert, cultural social expert, about why this Korean wave became what it became as, uh, to a allow us to have the kind of great exhibit at MFA that we do. Sounds so, great. Yeah. Sunday night. Good yeah. to see you. We'll hear you too and yeah. see you at 2 o'clock right you. here at the library. Okay. Thanks, Callie Crossley. Thank you. We'll be speaking with Callie Crossley, host of Under the Radar with Callie Crossley, which you can catch Sunday nights right here, 89.7 at 6 o'clock. You can also hear Callie's Callie commentaries Mondays for GBH's Morning Edition. Callie, of course, is also co-host of GBH's Culture Show, which is going to air daily, which airs daily, but it's going to air today right here at the Boston Public Library right after us at a little bit after 2 o'clock. Coming up next, another culture show star, GBH executive editor, Jared Bowen, executive arts editor, that is. He is back. He's going to tell us about one of the most incredible art scams ever. Jared Bowen is next. You're listening to Boston Public Radio, 89.7 GBH. We are broadcasting live from the Boston Public Library and streaming at youtube.com slash GBH News. I'm Arun Roth. Coming up on GBH's All Things Considered, child labor trafficking is prevalent across a wide swath of local industries. Nahant has lost its bid to use eminent domain to stop the expansion of a Northeastern University Research Center. And this week's Joybeat, an organization that helps people turn houses into homes with donated furniture. It started with one request for help and now helps furnish over 2,000 homes each year. Those stories in all the day's news starting at 4 here on GBH 89.7. Funding for our programs comes from you. And Longy School of Music, presenting a jazz concert celebrating the life of Eric Jackson with performances by Bill Banfield, Imagine Orchestra, and Chelsea Green, April 20th in Cambridge. More at longy.edu. And We Clean Heat Pumps, serving the region with cleaning and maintenance of ductless mini-split heat pumps to help purify air and capture mold, dust, and debris as AC season is here. More at wecleanheatpumps.com. Welcome back to Boston Public Radio. I'm Mardrigue and Jim Browdy. We're live at the library. Stream at youtube.com slash GBH News. want to remind you, May 3rd, which I think is a Friday, we will be broadcasting live from UMass Boston University Hall, I believe. Uh, we'll be joined by Governor Healy for an hour, former EPA administrator from Dorchester, Gina McCarthy, Paul English, who is funding, he's from Kayak and other, you know, whatever, startups, and he's funding a lot of the AI stuff out there, and the new chancellor, Marcelo Suarez Orozco, no tickets needed, uh, just uh, May 3rd, put in your calendar. We're joined now at the desk by Jared Bone, back from another junket to New York City. <laughs> GBH News, well, that's right, is it not? Yeah, He's a it nice is. Guy. Don't be go embarrassed. To New York for the GBH Broadway. News yeah. Executive Arts Editor, host of the Culture Show, which airs daily at two, right here on 89.7, and on Fridays, and this would be Friday, airs right here at the Boston Public Library. Welcome home, Jared. Nice to see you. <laughs> Steve. See you. To find junket. If, yeah. If by junket you mean I traveled to New York to see stuff. I meant junket. That's what I meant when I said junket. You had a junket to New York City, and it's great. You saw some great junket things. Junket implies You're back. that I was paid to go there by somebody. Well, uh, okay. Nice he to does. see you. I mean, he's trying to give you a hard time. I'm not at all. Jared. And Don't I, pay any attention I fell to him. right into it. Thank right. you. So, so tell us about this, this unbelievable art heist. The Guardian's got a great art fraud. Art fraud. That's right. Tell us. I know I hate these stories, but I love these stories. But I hate these stories because it's so bad about the art world. But it's, so let's just separate this out. This is not the museum world, but this is the high-end art market, and this is the ugly side of the art world. So there's a new book out that's called All the Glitters, and it's about these two guys. Uh, one of them is a writer of this, Orlando Whitfield, but it's more about um, Inigo Philbrick or Inigo Philbrick, who 
basically has been described as a mini Madoff, and they were people who leveraged the high-end art market to steal money and to leverage accounts and relationships and high-end artists and high-end buyers so that they could shuffle the money around and collect millions and millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars. And so, of course, because it was a mini Madoff scheme, it all came crum crumbling down. But it all speaks to the inflated nature of this market and how people, high-end investors, use art as just investments. But they don't realize, in this case, and in many others, what's happening around them, which is you have people who are bidding up prices at auctions so that they can take a, have a higher take, that there are artists who become inflated. Uh, and this is all outside of what the artists are making, because you often have artists who are sitting in their studio watching their, er their work sell years down the road for yeah. tens of millions of dollars. Did they get any of that money? Absolutely not. Uh, this for something they may have sold for a couple of thousand dollars earlier Can on in their career. Can you imagine that? It's, Especially if you're sitting in a little dumpy little apartment. It's awful. <laughs> yeah. I mean, in some, oftentimes, by the time an artist is selling for that kind of work, the current work they're making will bring in that kind of return, but not always. And so this is a story, I haven't read the book, but in reading about this story and understanding it, which we see play out time and time again uh, in all that glitters, it's, it's just really ugly. And why do we care about that? I mean, other than sort of the salacious part, of it, why do, what's the trickle-down impact? If there is, it. my understanding is the Madoff-like thing is he sells the painting and then he sells it again to somebody else. That's his deal, right? Yeah, the viewer, the the uh, collectors didn't even know sometimes that their work was being sold because often what happens because it's just an investment, somebody pays a lot of money for something and then puts it in a warehouse somewhere and it doesn't actually go onto museum walls or anything. Okay, so is there any trickle-down impact on us? Is just about rich people getting screwed? Well, I think the trickle-down <laughs> is because this inflation happens. Art gets pulled out of the public realm. So if we're not talking about contemporary oh. artists, but if you're buying Renaissance paintings or if you're trying to buy, well, look at the, the Salvatore Mundi Leonardo da Vinci painting, that went into private hands and sometimes has surfaced. We're supposed to go into that, uh, into a Louvre exhibition. But because it becomes unaffordable unless it's gifted directly to museums. Like for instance, I just saw that Norman Lear's collection is being auctioned off, but it's being auctioned off, it's not going to a museum collection, which I didn't quite understand, but of course that's his heirs, that's what they want to do. But when work's costing 20, 30, 40 uh -huh. million dollars, a museum can't afford this and then it's just gone. Got it. Okay, we're talking to Jared Bowen, the head of the head or host or whatever, the culture show, which airs at two o'clock today right here at the library. So uh, this next piece from LiveScience.com talks about these ancient artists being high on hallucinogenic drugs when they were creating art. And as Jim said before, Weren't an awful lot of artists high on different kind of <laughs> drugs when they were? It wasn't just ancient times in Peru. I think that's true. I think that's fair. Yeah, this is really interesting to understand what's happened here. So there were these uh, paintings or, or renderings that have been found on rocks and whatnot in Peru. This is dating from 1400 to 2100 and uh, BC, of course. And those have been compared with 20th century works that were done by artists in the Amazonian rainforest. However, the, the, the contemporary artists, the 20th century ones, were on hallucinogenics when they painted these works, which looked like people dancing. And they're very similar to what were painted thousands and thousands of years ago. So now the theory is that because they're so similar, these are images that came out of hallucinogenics, even though they probably weren't the same drugs that were imbibed at the time. Yeah, I wonder what they had in, a, in ancient No, Peru. they describe it. It was some drink they made from roots yeah. or some yeah, seed, whatever. Seed thing. pods. Kind of. Seed pods? Seed pods, yeah. Something seed you haven't pods. tried, Marjorie. Haven't tried that, question. no. Okay, but. I don't think they had gummies. <laughs> no gummies, okay. No. Okay, I have to say, I don't care about that at all. Is that okay? I'm <laughs> sorry, I don't mean to be difficult, but I, here's what I do care about. I had never heard of some of these artists until I was reading a piece. I know you went and saw this Harlem Renaissance and Transatlantic Modernism. I, 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 William H. Johnson, I think his name is. I started looking at his stuff last night. It is just breathtakingly powerful. What's the exhibit and what's the historical meaning of this at the, uh, at the Met in New York City? So the exhibit is the Harlem Renaissance and Transatlantic Modernism. That's the name of this show, On View at the Met through July 28th, and it's really significant because, first of all, it's one of just few exhibitions that look, have looked at the Harlem Renaissance. It's also really significant because if you look at the history of the Met and the Harlem Renaissance, it's shocking. Because in 1969, they, the Met had a show called Harlem on My, on My Mind, presumably about the Harlem Renaissance. Do you know what it was missing? Art. 
art and art by black people. Mm. Like, none at all. It was just unbelievable. The good thing to come out of it, though, is that there were a lot of protests around this, as you might imagine, and, and black artists stepping forward and saying, this is, how could you do this? And so this is when you saw a very large call, one that has been echoed ever since, and very notably in the last few years, again, is that you have to have black artists represented in your collections. You have to have black curators and people in administration that can tell these stories. So. The Met has been clear in saying this isn't trying to answer this more than 50 years later. However, it is finally telling the story. And so you find this vast array of art that tells the story of the Harlem Renaissance. But also, I came away with the understanding that this wasn't contained to just Harlem and New York. This was something, this was kind of a philosophy about art and about black culture and about aspiration that spread across the world. I was very excited to actually see a work by Mita Vo Warwick Fuller. Uh, there were two works, two sculptures, and she's somebody who is well represented, including her studio, at the Danforth Museum in mm. Framingham, Massachusetts. Oh. So you're finding this in Chicago and Framingham, and then people like Matisse and Picasso who were coming into this realm because they were so uh, overjoyed by what they were seeing, this expression of music and photography and art, and it's all represented. And to your point, Jim, there were two people I was really struck by. One was Aaron Douglas, these beautiful, serene murals all in one gallery. And he was somebody who was taking on this uh, notion of history painting, but rendering the aspirations of freedom, equality, opportunity through these biblical allegories. And then Archibald Motley Jr., who you'll, when you look him up, you'll just want to go out and party and drink martinis and have champagne and listen to great music because this is what he depicted, these nightclub life in Paris and New York. And, and it's just so vibrant and colorful and fun. In fact, it's so fun. The only thing I was missing in the gallery and really felt like I was missing this was music. You just wanted to hear music of the time. Yeah, but I'm, since I mentioned William H. Johnson, who I knew nothing about, the one thing you should just Google if you have is street life. A street life, that's what it's yeah. called, is just, it, it's just otherworldly beautiful. So while you're on that junket, you also went to Broadway. <laughs> and you, I mean, again, I don't mean that in a pejorative way at all. Of course he does. We envy you. Mm -hmm. You saw, what is it called? Water the Elephants? No, Water for Elephants. Water for Elephants, mm -hmm. the musical. What's that about? Yeah, so this is based on the 2006 novel and the 2011 movie. It's been adapted several times and now it reaches the stage. And it's a really, really lovely story. Uh, it's a new musical and it tells its story of basically a love triangle. And this all happens when this young man, uh, at the very beginning of the, the, the musical, we learn that he's lost his parents to a horrible car accident. And he's very young, not very young, he's enough to have some veterinarian training. But because he's lost his parents, he has no family, he sets out on the world and jumps on a train, literally jumps on the, a train in the Depression era to take off and find a new life. Well, the train he happens to literally jump on is a circus train. And so he joins a circus. He thinks it's going to be just for a limited time. Uh, but he kind of falls in love with one of the performers who happens to be married to the ringmaster slash owner of the circus. And the, the circus. And this is where this love triangle comes to bear. And so flash forward, the reason it's called Water for Elephants is because as the circus is kind of going under during the Depression, they have a chance to buy a 52-year-old elephant who might revive their performances, and this is rendered in puppetry. And we're in this moment where we've seen a lot of puppets on stage. War Julie Taymor and, starting yeah, the whole Lion thing. King, absolutely. Newton's own Julie Taymor. Uh, who went to high school with my mom. Is that true? Really? I didn't know that. Yep. Oh, yep. really? Um, and so... We see this done quite beautifully. It's not over the top, but you see this, the elephant rendered. I have to say one of the most beautiful scenes that happens early on, so I don't want to make it a spoiler alert, but one of the animals is lost. Uh, and the, the performer who is with that animal is caressing it. It's a puppet, but also an acrobat who's portraying this character. And then the, as the animal dies, the puppet lifts up into the ceiling. And oh. you, it's like its soul and its spirit is just going off. It was one of the most beautiful renderings I've ever seen using puppetry. It was just a gorgeous moment. Because not only is there puppetry, but there's also a, a circus element to this too, which is just blended in with the storytelling and choreography. It's a very, very successful show. I think it's going to do very well as the Tony nominations come out very well, shortly. Well, we got a little sound from it. Uh, in this particular scene, Isabella McCalla and Grant Gustin are performing wild. and the uh, performance, the play is uh, the it's a musical actually, Water for Elephants. When was the last time you were silent? I don't mean quiet, I mean you could hear yourself inside. I don't know. You should try, cause when I listen, after all that
pretty good. Yeah. So I hate to disappoint you, we got to come back to Boston. Yeah, we do. <laughs> and the lyric stage, the wonderful lyric stage, the drowsy chaperone. Yeah, and this is already, I, as I think I have this right, a critic's pick among the, the Boston Theatre Critics Association. But Drowsy Chaperone, this is just a really, really fun musical, and it's a love letter to musicals. Uh, it's on stage at the Lyric Stage Company through May 12th, and you enter in, into the theater and you find Man in Chair. That's the name of this character, and he's, you can tell that he's kind of, he seems a, a little down. He's looking for an upper, and he's in his New York apartment, and he's directly speaking to the audience. And he puts on a record because he wants to, to kind of lift his spirits, revisit one of his favorite shows of all time, which is called The Drowsy Chaperone, fictional show. And so he starts to play this record, and the musical surfaces in his living room. And it's from the 20s or 30s, so it's kind of farcical and slapstick, and you've got the gangster characters and thwarted love, and you have the drowsy, gin-soaked chaperone. And for this production, the Lyric Stage Company has really gathered the, the creme de la creme of Boston actors and singers, and it has all coalesced really, really beautifully to just be so much fun. It just grows bigger and bigger and bigger, and the energy is just hugely infectious. We get some sound from that, We do. That Take too. it away. This is a clip from Drowsy Chaperone, the narrator called Man in Chair, as Jared just said, and played by Paul Melendi. He speaks to the audience. Let's disappear for a while into the decadent world of the 1920s, where the champagne flowed while the caviar chilled and the whole world was a party. For the wealthy, anyway. So I dug about, and what did I find? But one of my favorite shows, Gable and Stein's The Drowsy Chaperone. Remember? <laughs> That's there to, at the yeah. lyric stage till May 12th. You know, we haven't asked you this in a few months, and we ask you every several months post-pandemic. Uh, How is Boston theater doing? I think it's still very much on the road to recovery. What I have noticed is we have basically three levels of theater. One is the big theater, the, your American Repertory Theater, the Huntington, Broadway, and Boston. Then the mid-level, like Speakeasy Stage Company or Lyric Stage, and then Small and Fringe. There aren't that many productions by small and fringe theater companies. We've also seen new repertory theater shut down, and audiences just aren't fully back. And I think that buying habits have really changed, which is having a terrible impact. What do you mean by that? It used to be that you would... They, theaters could count on people either one having subscriptions or as soon as a release goes out about a show or they know it's coming people will buy weeks in advance to have their tickets now people are deciding, deciding spur of the moment so it's really really hard for companies to figure out how their shows are going to do or how they're selling in advance and so it's, it's really hard to structure an entire season so I think we're still very much seeing the toll. Broadway is also a very similar example, so Boston isn't the only community facing this. In fact, there are a whole slew of shows, more than have been seen in years and years and years, about to open on Broadway, and there won't be room for all of them. Broadway is a different story because I think the ticket prices have just become outrageous, and a lot of people are talking about that. Patty Lupone just maybe we she just talked about with her when she was yeah. on a few weeks ago. Yeah. yeah, it's become I think she's called it schlock. Mm -hmm. Water for Elephants I would not put in that category. There are other musicals you can argue very much belong in that category because they're just trying to put something that's familiar and they know is going to do razzle dazzle for audiences. There is art in um, Water for Elephants, but. Yeah, I think there's a reckoning still to come for theater, both regionally and nationally. And it's a shame because so much fabulous work is being done right now. Especially here, so go see a show. Okay, so Jared, at 2 o'clock. No, 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 no. We're not done. We're not, We're not done. done. Occasionally, Jared and Marjorie and I go out. Excuse me, Jared, I'm <laughs> broaching a topic here. Uh, every once in a while, Marjorie and I go out. We either go out for dinner or for a drink and we talk about things. What would you say? You can, say, you can disclose anything. What do you think is the most common? topic of conversation between the three of us. So what is it? Uh, how great BPR is. <laughs> well, actually, that is the most common topic. The second well, most one common half topic. Of it, anyway. No, excuse me? Or one half of it. Thank you. Anyway. The most common topic, uh, which for some reason Jared is avoiding, is why in Greek statues are the men's penises so small? <laughs> And how many times have we discussed this? Like a hundred? Like maybe a hundred? Tell the truth. Maybe a hundred times. Maybe a thousand. Now apparently there is some research that is, maybe a thousand, that has come out that answers the question. And I was hoping, everybody want to hear the answer to this? Yes or no? Yes. Yeah, I mean obviously the crowd's wild here. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, do you, why, let me repeat, why are men's penises so small in Greek statues, uh, Jared Bowen? 
Yeah. You're an art guy. I mean, you're the culture show, the art guy, whatever. What, what's the reason? This is Jim's idea. What's, up? what's not my idea? It's yeah, a, a know, lot of art I, people I are concerned that. about this. What's the answer? I know, burning question everywhere I go. I can stop saying, it. Exactly. <laughs> All the time. So put it to rest. Answer the damn question. What's the answer to the question? Well, I've, I've always understood it to be yeah. you wanted to be modest and to depict anything large would be vulgar and mm -hmm. that's right. too suggestive. And so this is why you often see smaller renderings. You're not being quite as expansive in your answer as you are in most other things. I mean, this is, I mean, we, we remember we were talking about, was it David or something, where they're putting a little keychains David, and that sort of yeah, thing? David, yeah, David, that's okay, right. Okay, well, that's not much of an He's answer, an Jared, but that's what... It, well, according to the story from oh, the New York you. Post, which is the source of all good information, yeah. as yeah. we know, that it was a badge of the highest culture and a paragon exactly. of civilization right. uh, to be smaller rather than larger in Greek. Exactly ideals of male bodies. And they certainly spent a lot of time sculpting male bodies. They gave a lot of thought to this, right? Do you have any comment on that? Uh, I, 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 you can spend more time with the chisel el elsewhere. <laughs> exactly. That <laughs> is a right. beautiful That's concept. That's right. Because they do have always, they always have very nice uh, abdominal muscles yes, in exactly. those Greeks. And, and, and nice, yeah, yep. that's right. Nice biceps and all that kind of stuff. Well, I got to so be honest. You didn't add much to the conversation. Yeah. But yeah. thank you for... Uh, well, it's a very short, short answer. Oh, thank you. But <laughs> I'm bummed. Thank you. Okay, now you, uh, you're free. What are you doing at 2 o'clock right here in this very studio, Jared uh, Bond? Right here in this very studio, we'll talk about Taylor Swift. We'll also talk about the Venice Biennale, which is just about to open this weekend. And for people who don't know, it's a big contemporary art fair. It has been in existence since the late 1800s, but it shows us a lot about the society of today because you have 80-something countries who participate. So Fair enough. In Taylor Swift, it's her new album, 31 Songs. Her new album times two, yeah, her exactly. Her new album times two. What do you think of it? I think, as I've been thinking about this, that I'm more of a Beyonce person. Okay. <laughs> you can be both. You're allowed okay. to be both. You know yeah. that? I know. I don't have to pick and choose, but I think that's where I'm leaning. Okay. Two o'clock culture show. Let's hear for Jared Bowen. Jared Bowen, thank, thank you very you much. We have been speaking with GBH News Executive Arts Editor and the host of the Culture Show, which airs at 2 o'clock, right after we're done, right after the 2 o'clock news right here on GBH 89.7. And they're going to be down here at the Boston Public Library, too, if you want to come see the Culture Show in person. By the way, Jared is going to be the MC of this weekend's Literary Lights Dinner, and we're going to be joined by two honorary people from that are going to be at the Literary Lights Dinner, one of this year's honorees, and the person introducing that honoree, our next legendary Boston Globe sports columnist and Boston Globe associate editor Dan Shaughnessy, along with the guy who hosted for many years NPR's Only a Game, Bill Littlefield. Dan Shaughnessy and Bill Littlefield are next on Boston Public Radio, 89.7 GBH. Broadcast. violence and identify shooters, but a new ACLU report suggests nearly 70% of alerts lead to dead ends. I'm Katie Lannon. This week on Talking Politics, we'll discuss the findings and if this service is a waste of money for Boston. Plus, GBH News transit reporter Bob C. will bring us highlights from his recent forum with MBTA General Manager Philip Ng. Join me for Talking Politics tonight at 7 on GBH2. Support for GBH comes from you and the Boston Speakers Series, announcing its upcoming season at Symphony Hall for seven evenings, featuring Liz Cheney, Andrew Lloyd Webber, news anchor Chris Wallace, and artificial intelligence entrepreneur Oren Etzioni. bostonspeakers.org. And Hebrew Senior Life, a Harvard Medical School affiliate, empowering seniors to reach their full potential with a wide range of services. You can discover senior living, healthcare, aging research, and more at allweareforyou.org. I'm Nicole Garcia, producer for BPR, and you're listening to 89.7 WGBH HD1 Boston, online at gbhnews.org. GBH News with NPR, what matters to you.
Welcome back to Boston Public Radio. I'm Jim Browdy. She's Marjorie. And we're live at the Boston Public Library. Stream at youtube.com slash GBH News. A reminder, May 3rd, it's a Friday. We are not here. We'll be live at UMass Boston and University Hall for a special remote broadcast celebrating the elevation of Marcelo Suarez Orozco to Chancellor. We'll be joined by Governor Healy for an hour, EPA, former EPA Administrator Gina McCarthy, a Dorchester kid, Paul English, who's spending a lot of money out there on AI stuff and all that sort of thing. I also want to introduce, before we start, because it's relevant to this next discussion, our host, the head of the Boston Public Library, David Leonard. David, nice to see you. Thanks so much for being here. We're joined now, Marjorie used the word legendary, and we do have a couple of legendary media types. I'm guessing at least one of them hates that. That is Boston Globe <laughs> sports columnist and associate editor, Dan Shaughnessy. He's author of numerous books. The latest of is uh, Wish It Lasted Forever, Life with Larry Bird, Celtics. Did you know he's appearing at the damn Dick's Sporting Goods opening tomorrow, Larry Bird? Are you sure? I am 100%. <laughs> it's exactly my reaction. This Sunday, Dan's going to be honored at this year's Literary Lights Dinner hosted by the Associates of the Boston Public Library. He'll be presented or introduced or whatever the proper verb is by the great Bill Littlefield. Bill's, of course, the former host for 25 years of NPR sports program out of BUR, Only a Game. He's also the author of a number of books, most recently the 2020 novel Mercy. Normally, we tell you how to get tickets to these kinds of things. They are sold out. But for more information, maybe you can beg your way in or at least learn about the wonderful organization or contribute, go to associatesbpl.org. Dan, congratulations. Bill, great to have you. Thanks, gentlemen, Good for being here. here. Yeah, thank, thank you. you very much uh, for coming in. So before we get into literary lights and everything else and sports and all that stuff, Dan Shaughnessy, you look like a million bucks and you've just been <laughs> through quite an ordeal. How are you doing? Uh, thank you, Marjorie. I'm doing okay. It's a slog. I had uh, a quadruple bypass at the Brigham. Great yes. health care. It's treated very well. Thank you, everybody there. And uh, yeah, so I'm like a couple months in, and it's a slog, but a little better every day. And haven't been getting out much, Marjorie. <laughs> but seeing you on the other side of the of the podium, the microphone here. That's right. You and I. I, I started you That's in radio. That's right. I we broke had, for God. Young yeah. Marjorie, I broke her in. He, you did. You know? we had a, it wasn't we had exactly a, how it happened, but thank you very great, much for reminding us. We had a career at WTKK. I remember our legendary Thanksgiving broadcast. I was just going to bring that up. How you, if you brine your turkey, if you don't brine your turkey. And we played Arlo Guthrie. It took up 22 <laughs> minutes. It was perfect. You know, yeah, it was, it was good. <laughs> you know, I don't want to belabor this thing. We asked Brian McGrory, your former boss, if this is true, and he said it was. I don't believe it. You find out you need this super duper surgery. You call your kid on the phone, you say, bring me two things, bring me a, my computer and a meatball sub. Is that right. true? The latter, not it's the all computer. True. It, was, it was Tuesday, February 7th, I guess. And I went in for what I thought was going to be an angiogram. You know, I threw my keys at the guy at the Brigham. He says, when are you back out? I said, see you in two hours. And it was 11 days later. I went in, they didn't like the angiogram. They said, you're not going anywhere. You're going upstairs. We're going to do the bypass in the morning. And I had a column that was close to being finished. The work was done, so I figured I'll, I'll just cap this off and, uh, and file it. And, of course, I had to have my last meal. <laughs> That's right. So, yeah, my, my son sub. went to Oak Square Brighton to get the meatball sub and brings the laptop in. And I texted Theo Epstein. I said, listen, I just got to cap off the column. Can you talk to me tonight? He says, tonight's not good. How about in the morning? I said, the morning's not good. <laughs> I was the all-time, like, I said, I have heart surgery in the morning. Well, that led to one thing or another, and, and yeah, the column was filed, and honest to God, I, I could have been dead by the time it had appeared in the Globe. Beautifully so put luckily there. luckily it was there. Should yeah. read Brian's great column. You know, we did what you're doing for him last year for Alex Beam. Marjorie and I introduced Alex Beam as one of the honorees. Uh, I said one of the reasons that Marjorie and I and Alex got along so well is because we all hated the same people. Nobody <laughs> laughed except me, Marjorie, and Alex. But so that's, you're the boys in the band. That's the important thing. Exactly. Audience. That's my. <laughs> that's right. What are you going to say about him? Uh, what are you going to say about him? I'm not going to tell you that. No, give us the a little hit, couple of hints, couple no, of teasers. Is, it's be headline stuff. It's very brief. <laughs> brief. You can't have it. Now. Brevity. Okay. Yeah. Well, what do you think about him? <clears throat> I think that. Um, one of the things that counts most in sports, if you talk to athletes uh, in any sport, it's great to have a terrific season, it's great to be named most valuable player, all these sorts of things that happen. But the thing that really counts most is longevity. And the things that the players respect is the long career, the, the guy who delivers or the woman who delivers year after year after year, who can be counted on to make his or her teammates better 
make the team something that people want to continue to, to be associated with. And I think Dan is the definition of that in, in this business. I want to yeah. say one more second, Bill. I'm sorry. I'm not going to let you off the hook in terms of what you're going to say at the ceremony. I knew I should have talked longer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. no, but I assume you can tell us. Uh, it's obvious you're going to be reading, uh, uh, obviously, praise from people like Robert Kraft and John Henry, correct? <laughs> you know, I'm telling you, I'm not going to do this. You can't have this. I got it all written down back on my computer, and it's... it's you want the best thing? Your but longevity. You're, you're, you're on the right track. I figured I'll I would. Well, the longevity, longevity is huge, but I want to say one thing. The thing about you, and I say this to Marjorie all the time, about Dan Shaughnessy, a lot of people trash players and owners when they're acting poorly. You're one of the few people in this business who the next day is willing to go to the meeting or the event or the clubhouse where that player or owner is. And I, I, that is too rare, not just in the sports media world, but in the political media world, and you deserve huge praise for it. You well, really. I had good it. teachers. Madri knows that. The people who were in the industry when we came into it, that's what we were taught. And that's what you do. Yeah, we were we were there when, in, in the heyday. I would say at the creation. About, the creation. That's <laughs> right. We talk about longevity. You did only a game every Saturday morning for like 25 years. So for people yes, who did. who don't know about it, just give them an idea. It was a very creative look at sports. What'd you do? And why'd you stop? Answer that one too. Yeah. Well, I, I, which question you want first? I mean, <laughs> it, it was the creative idea was that, that there were an awful lot of great stories that happened to be set in sports that uh, other media were not paying any attention to, and particularly women's sports, and then particularly soccer. And what I found was when I would go into the places to talk to people who were involved with these sports, I was always incredibly warmly welcomed. It was very different from yeah. going to see the Patriots, the Bruins, the Red Sox, or the Celtics, you know, who, who couldn't care less about a weekly public radio show and, and access was tough to get. But boy, when I went to go see the Women's Pro Soccer League, they couldn't have been nicer. And when the revolution opened for business, the first thing they did was give me a season parking pass. Oh, you know, that's I never great. got in. I never got one of those from that's the Celtics great. or the Bruins, that's you know? Great. So it was partly reinforcement. But I really did find that there were some terrific stories out there uh, that, that people weren't, you know, paying much attention to in the mainstream uh, press. And then the other thing was we were in it for fun. Yeah. So when I heard, for example, about a guy who had built a replica of an Aztec ballpark in his backyard, <laughs> I got in the car and I drove out there. I thought, this guy's got something. This is pretty interesting, you know. So. We were always looking for the stuff that was a little bit offbeat and have some fun with it. Yeah, well, it was a great show. I enjoyed it very much. I'm not Thank even you. that into sports except for Jan Shaughnessy's column, which well, I Wait a second, but you didn't answer the second question. Oh, why'd you quit? There isn't, there uh, isn't a show like that. I mean, they talked about we're going to find a successor. We're gonna, there is no successor. Why'd there you was leave? No, well, uh, Karen Given hosted and produced for a while after I left. Yeah. Um, there were some other things that I really wanted to do. And one of them uh, was uh, I really wanted to go to work for the Emerson Prison Initiative, and I, I work with guys who are incarcerated who are trying to get a college degree, and I've been doing that since 2018. Uh, and I wanted to do some writing that wouldn't have an editor looking over my shoulder all the time and yeah. that I didn't have to collaborate with. So I wrote a couple of books that, uh, that were just what I wanted to write. No. That's the voice fun. of Bill Littlefield. He's here with Dan Shaughnessy. Dan's being honored by Literary Lights from the Associates of the Boston Public Library. And uh, he's going to be introduced, celebrated by Bill. And they're joining us at the Boston Public Library. You know, it's said that uh, I'm not in, in sports all the time. I, I have been kind of fascinated by, and you've written about this, this kind of upsurge in women's basketball. Is this like a Caitlin Clark one, <laughs> one and done thing, or is this going to keep going? What do you think? It's hard to know how much bounce they'll get moving forward. Clearly, the college game was bigger than the men this year. It was unbelievable. And that's great. The TV ratings were greater than the men. So I don't know how much of a one-off that is because of her. You know, she was such a celebrity, and the whole country caught on to that. I don't know that it'll translate to the WNBA, yeah. which is a tougher sell. I play during the summer. It's a weird thing. And, you know, everybody knows the salaries are lower, and they fly commercial, and it's just not the same as the NBA. The demand for the product isn't the same. But the college game, there's a lot of interesting players, and I think folks are going to stay with that moving forward. Did you enjoy the women's? Oh, sure. You did. I enjoyed it. I didn't like it when Connecticut 20 years ago was killing everybody mm -hmm. by 100 points because there was no competition. They were great, but I like competition. Now, 
there's so many teams. You don't know who's going to win. And that's why we tuned in. When that, uh, that situation prevailed at Connecticut, uh, we did a story. We went down and saw Gina Auriemma. It was long enough ago, so Rebecca Lobo was still yeah, an sure. undergraduate at Connecticut. Wow. And uh, so I, I got a chance to speak to Gino Ariema for a while. And uh, when we were finished, I said, let me ask you one thing. And just with exactly what you were talking about, Dan, there, there, were, there was Tennessee and there were a few other teams. But I said, if you had somebody call you who was a coach of a women's team at a, at a university and he really wanted or she really wanted to put a good program together, what's the first thing you'd tell him? And he said, recruit Rebecca Lobo. <laughs> really? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so that's, that's how yeah. kind of uh, uh, shallow the pool was at that yeah. point, you know. And, and, but now, I mean, Dan is oh, right. It, it, the, not only are the colleges, the, so many more colleges are fe fielding great teams, but uh, the program's all the way down, you know. Uh, girls and young women getting interested much earlier, getting into organized programs much earlier, people taking it more seriously at an earlier age, and that, that can only lead to good things. Well, do you think, I mean, answer the question that Dan wasn't sure about. Is this a Caitlin Clark phenomenon right now, or is that, didn't you try out to, I just realized, to be broadcaster of the Breakers or something like 400 I years ago? I did, I, I tried out to, to be the PA guy for, for the Breakers, and, and uh, I said to the guy at the, at the outset, I said, I can't, this is for fun, right? This is just to do a story. And uh, there were like 12 guys, or 12 people trying out. And um, he said, yeah, yeah, I understand. It's just for the story. And I, I said, okay. So we, we did the tryout. And it was going to be whittled down to three finalists who were going to, you know, compete again. And he called me up and he said, you made the finals. <laughs> and I said, no, no, man. You don't understand. I, I can't be in the finals. I can't be broadcast. No, this is, this, is, this, is the, uh, this is the ultimate conflict of interest. I can't do this. So I didn't... I so didn't how about women's sports beyond Caitlin Clark when she's obviously drafted number one in the Well, WNBA? as I say, I'm a huge fan. And I mean, when, when, the, when the Breakers were here playing... Something happened to me, uh, which it has never happened in any other context of doing a story. I was down at uh, uh, Nickerson Field, where the, the Breakers played. It was the week uh, before the finals uh, that particular year. I was talking to Tiffany Milbritt, who was a, a, a player on the U.S. national team, and I was going to be playing in the finals. And we started talking and she said, say, wouldn't this sound better if we walked down the street to the studio and recorded oh. it there? And I'm looking, to, how many athletes say, <laughs> yeah. let yeah. me help you out by coming to the studio <laughs> instead of doing a field piece with all the buses and yeah. trucks going <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I mean, I'm a huge fan. Well, uh, so you know, you, you, you talked about kids starting younger. I mean, I, I, I um, could not help but notice when I watched March Madness this year and watched these women play, this wasn't like, and I mean, it sounds sexist about this, I used to tell my youngest daughter who was a really good soccer player, you know, your games are great, but the boys' games are so much faster and so much more aggressive and so much, I mean, they're more fun to watch. But the girls now, or the young women, I should say, I mean, the dribbling, the ball handling, the passing and all that, they, they've obviously started very, very young because you can't get that good, that I don't think, that fast. So the whole opportunity thing is different now for young women in sports, I think. You're not a sports guy, Marjorie, I know, but you just stumbled into something that's very true. The game is actually more appealing that the women play than the men at this point, because the men, the three-point shots, everybody's way from the perimeter. Yeah. No more give and go, pick and roll. No, the, the beauty of the passing, cutting. Too many And the women's game shots. has more of that. Yeah. It's, it's really like the men's game was in the 80s. So it's one of the reasons for the appeal. It's actually more fun to watch than guys just jacking up threes and, and you know, going down the other end. Yeah, it's speaking got, of it's men's games flow. in the 80s, I mentioned your book, great book about the Celtics, 84, 85. Is that, do I have the right? It goes from 82 to 86. 82 right? to 86, okay. So you were as shocked as I was when we, I w w drove in this morning, the door guy, wow. Mike, at the hotel, I said, what's going on Dick Dick's Sporting Goods? They're about to open their biggest store ever. It's about a half a block down. And he said, uh, in the next couple of days, David Ortiz is going to be there today. Okay, oh, that'd that, be great for you. Okay, mm -hmm. well, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's another joke that nobody else is yeah, going to get I, except the people. That uh, okay, and Larry Bird and supposedly Mikhail and Parrish. <clears throat> I don't know if it's true. And we checked it out. 
Birds, what is up with that? Birds in an Allstate commercial I see last night on television? Ba that's bags of cash. Okay, that's but what, what is that. this? Why is he here? Because there's bags that's of cash in <laughs> Dix. That's didn't, why. They didn't make those big bucks back when he was a big oh, star. Oh, yes, he did. Celtics. Well, he made a lot of money, but again, it's easy, quick money, and that's Capital One, and that's this, yeah. You know, I, I got an interesting, we're talking to Dan Shaughnessy and Bill Littlefield. Uh, Dan's getting honored at Literary Lights, and Bill's introducing him. Uh, uh, for, to benefit the associates of the Boston Public Library, which is a fabulous organization. Uh, your paper, for the first time ever this year, sent out something I loved. If you're a subscriber, you get an email. I don't know if you... Did you get an email saying, here's what you read most this year. Here are the people and whatever. Oh, yeah. And not so, and I think it was the top 15. 14 of the 15 were politics Sports. and justice. That, no, me, I'm talking about. Oh. Not the, me, you individually. Right. That's what was, was so great. The things you clicked on online. And number one was you. And I was surprised. I don't mean that. I know that comes out the wrong <laughs> way. I really, I'm sorry. I didn't mean it that way. And you know what I thought of? Beyond the fact that Marjorie and I talk about your work a lot, actually, uh, on and off the air, is in, we say this to artists, too, but I figure, considering what you guys do for a living, you were also the respite from the pain of the world. I don't mean mm. to be too heavy about this, but I think that's one of the reasons. When you have somebody as talented as you both are, one, and two, you get a break from the pain and sickness and viciousness of the world, even though some of the columns are vicious. Is that part of the draw, <laughs> do you think, or not? Oh, I think for readers, again, it's, it's a chance to get away from the things that divide us. And sometimes the Red Sox or Patriots divide us yeah, as well. But, but in a different kind of way. Everybody has an opinion, and even if you're like Marjorie or my wife and you don't have any interest in sports, you can't avoid it around here. You know, yeah. you, you, live, you live the life. I mean, why, my wife wants to know what time the Patriots game is so she knows when to go to the market. Because there won't be anyone <laughs> that's there. That's right. That's so, true. You know, you, but that's it, it's, true. A, it's a factor that's in true. life. So even if you try and avoid it, sports matters. Can I tell you, Marjorie's full of it, too, about not being a sports fan. TB12 used to be across the street. That's over. right. There was not a day that Marjorie here. did not talk about It was like 20 by 25 foot of Tom Brady. He was looking at me the whole time, Dan. It was unbelievable. Speaking of that, you wrote a piece for BUR a couple of years ago. I was reading this morning saying the only, something like the only, this is Bill I'm talking about. The only uh, thing that uh, Tom Brady's not good at is retiring. Yes. And then he does a podcast the other day. Very good at unretiring. In, yeah. Exactly. Intimating that he may unretire uh, yet again. What do you think? What do you both think about this? Um, I only can hope for the best. Which is? But having covered uh, chronic traumatic encephalopathy yeah. among football yeah. players and most especially pro football players for years until the point where, I mean, you asked earlier why I quit. Part of the reason was I got tired of my staff at WBUR saying, oh, for goodness sake, don't do another story on head injuries in football. Yeah. And I kept saying, yeah, but they keep injuring their heads in football. I got to get... Anyway, I really hope Tom Brady is okay. Yeah. By the way, Dr. Cantu, Chris Nowinski, we've had on the show, those people over there do some of the most important well, work. How do you feel about the, the Brady return there, oh, Don Oh, enough. Don Just stop with that. He, <laughs> he shouldn't need any more attention. And it, again, he's a wonderful <laughs> player, great career. Just stop with this. We don't need to hear it anymore. So, so uh, uh, last time I texted you, I think, was about your column. You should probably say the same thing about Bob Dylan. Well, me. Uh, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> it was about your column about Dynasty the, 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 that um, a lot of us watch with great excitement because at least the first few uh, episodes it was were really entertaining. uplifting. It was very and entertaining. We saw the, you know, the fight. The, the you want to say what it snow. is for the people who well, are Well, it's, a, it's a about the Patriots, yeah. a great run of Super Bowls. And at the beginning, when young Tom Brady shows up and the thing between him and Drew Bledsoe, which was very inspiring because I thought right. the world of Drew Bledsoe after uh, this. So I remember we interviewed his we father, had his father one time. On. And yeah. I remember his father said something like he asked about his son losing his job to Brady, and the father said he... No, we asked him about the touchdown pass he threw that got him into the further into the playoffs, and his response was, I was prouder of how he was when he sat on the bench yeah. than when he was throwing so that touchdown. So I thought touch. to myself, what beautiful. an unusual father. And anyway, and, uh, and then things got darker as, as, it, as it moved along, but you... I, this never occurred to me. Your the whole thesis of your column was that this was a... A Bob Craft PR effort. It's like a home movie. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the van vanity piece stamped, and then, you know, and I called it a farce, which is what it is. It's the narrative of history through Bob Craft, and he's trashing Bill Belichick and totally all these subtle, subtle digs. Bill Belichick. And then, you know, when all the players started coming out and saying, yeah, we didn't like that, that's, that's bad, it's negative, 
And then Bob chimed in saying, yeah, I, I didn't like it either. I said, that, that's like Marty Scorsese complaining that the flowers of Kill a Moon is too long. You know, I mean, you don't get to make it and then compl say, you didn't, yeah. it's just, yeah, yeah it's crazy. It, it was, it, we saw a lot of, uh, Mr. Crafts, everybody calls oh him, my and his son, Mr. and then Bob, they're in the tire office. Kicker, yeah. Bob. <laughs> yeah, but, but it, was, it was entertaining. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, and yeah. it made me kind of nostalgic sure. for the glory days no, there. No, it was fun to watch. Apple TV. Yeah, don't, we're not in the glory days anymore. All right, we're out of time. So before time? you go, oh, I haven't no. asked you, what are you going to say about him at this <laughs> event? <laughs> I think you should come. Okay. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you're a veteran. Yeah. You were there last we year. We were. You know where it is. Well, Audrey wants to come. come. Over. That's right. Yeah. It's, it's a great night. Everybody gets very dressed up. They have a wonderful cocktail hour. It is a hour, great, for great wonderful calls. Wonderful hors d'oeuvres, really good food. And you're always surrounded by these literary light people. Real writers. People. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> real writers. Yeah. Like yeah. you. I like that That's part. right. Yes, yeah, that's indeed. right. Well, listen. It's great to see you both. Um, Thanks so much. Congratulations. Congratulations. And I'm glad you're doing so well. And great to see you again, Bill. Thank you. We have been speaking with Boston Globe sports columnist, a legend. Associate Editor Dan Shaughnessy from the Boston Globe and longtime NPR host Bill Littlefield, another legend whose great show was uh, only a game on Saturday mornings. And he left it after 25 years, but 25 years is a long time, Jim. Dan is going to be honored at this Sunday's Literary Lights Dinner, hosted by the Associates of the Boston Public Library. It is sold out. Uh, but for more information anyway, go to associatesbpl.org. Maybe you can get ready for next year. Thank you very much to Dan Shaughnessy and Bill Littlefield. Coming up after a quick break, we're going to talk with Embrace Boston's Imari Paris Jeffries. You're listening to Boston Public Radio 89.7 GBH. I'm Arun Roth. Coming up on GBH's All Things Considered, child labor trafficking is prevalent across a wide swath of local industries. Nahant has lost its bid to use eminent domain to stop the expansion of a Northeastern University Research Center. And this week's Joybeat, an organization that helps people turn houses into homes with donated furniture. It started with one request for help and now helps furnish over 2,000 homes each year. Those stories in all the day's news starting at 4 here on GBH 89.7. Funding for our programs comes from you. And Johnson & Wales University, providing students with hands-on learning, industry-experienced faculty, and engaging internships. You can discover more at jwu.edu. And Atlantic Design Center by Eldridge Lumber & Hardware, committed to helping you achieve your vision for a new kitchen or bathroom and guiding you from design to completion with showrooms in York and Portland, Maine. AtlanticDesignCTR.com. Welcome back to Boston Public Radio. Mark Regan and Jim Browdy. We're live at the Boston Public Library, streaming at youtube.com slash gbhnews. This is a Friday. I think two Fridays from now is May 3rd, whatever day it is. We'll be uh, broadcasting live from University Hall at UMass Boston. You're all welcome, whether or not you're a UMass Boston attendee or faculty or not. We'll have the governor for an hour, Governor Healy, former EPA administrator, a local woman, Gina McCarthy, Paul English, who's donating a lot of money to make sure AI is integrated into, in a good way, throughout the campus, and the newly elevated chancellor, Marcelo Suarez Orozco, and many more. We hope you join us. We're joined now by Amari Paris Jeffries. He's the executive director of Embrace Boston. Amari, it's great to see you. Great to be back. Thank you. Yeah, great to see you again, uh, Amari. So tell us, tell us what this uh, um, Embrace Ideas Festival is all about. This is our third annual celebration festival to celebrate Juneteenth. I think Boston has a unique opportunity to be the leader in Juneteenth, this new holiday. I think we were one of the first states to recognize it as a state-sanctioned holiday during the pandemic. And so we're excited to bring it back for a third year. And what, where is it going to be and what's it going to be? It is going to be hosted by our friends at Mass Art. And so Mass Art has been a consistent champion, Mary Grant, the president there, who is amazing. And yeah. so we'll have Isabel Wilkerson, Marcus Samuelson, and wow. other, other wow. folks that people know. And so it's going to be a great day. Oh, my goodness. And, you know, this, as you said, is the third. And uh, while it is really important, and I mean this term in an endearing, not a damning way, to always have the usual suspects at anything coming, staying energized, getting energized. Is the reach extending beyond the people who you would have predicted before the first one would care enough to show up? A absolutely. You know, you mentioned earlier our friend Paul English, and so, yeah. you know, Paul's always a mastermind of ideas, and so when we had this idea to build a monument, we knew we needed to activate it, and so, you know, we can't activate it if we don't have folks there, and so I think we've upped 
who our keynote speakers are. He gave the are. first million for he gave, the Embrace, the He statue. gave the first million. He was, he's our founder. He was the one that really got the ball rolling. And so, and, and we're both UMass Boston guys, and so there's this other connection there. And so I think we're expen, extend, extending our reach. Uh, I think this opportunity for folks who are not black or African American to also celebrate Juneteenth, this federal holiday, is, is really our, our point and our purpose. I so, know you, UMass Boston guy. That's, that's becoming a powerhouse of a school over it, there. And you I, should show up on May 3rd then, too. We'll talk to you about it in a minute. I'm I, serious. It's, it's going to be a good day. You know, and Marcelo is doing an amazing yeah, job, and the great. chancellor before him, Keith Motley. I think you know, we are on the shoulders of the work of Keith Motley, and so we're, we're so fortunate as a university. And also the views. I mean, you're right on the water over there. I mean, that, that whole glass student union thing there is absolutely gorgeous. I mean, who would have thought, you know, when I was there in 93 as an undergraduate 93? student? 93? 93. Jesus. Well, God. let me tell you this other story. I don't think I went it was to, so nice in 93. It, it wasn't. It was, yeah. it was dark. It was brown. Um, you know, <laughs> but I feel every bit of 93. The other night I was uh, at the Bad Bunny concert with my <laughs> wife. And I was telling a friend earlier, I had to wear my headphones in the concert just so I could hear myself think. Oh, God. And so I realized in that moment, I, I am a graduate of UMass Boston in 93. Can you, I don't want to leave this Ideas Festival. Though. Tell us a little bit more about what's going to happen. I mean, what kind of program? What, what, can people, what will people encounter? You, you know, it, it, I think it's, it's very much like uh, a, a traditional festival in the sense that, you know, it, it is an ideas festival. And I think June is also Black Music Month. June is also Pride Month. And so I think this intersection of ideas centering black music, black ideas, black joy is the point of Juneteenth. And I think it's open enough where anyone, even those who are not black American, should attend. So uh, we had these discussions with you almost every time you're here, and you're going to be here more regularly, so we don't have to repeat it every time. For people who thought that the statue was the beginning and the end, and by the way, it would have been a great end, even if it had, had been an end, it is far from it. Explain what the agenda over the next bunch of years is of Embrace Boston. You know, I think when we built the monument, we knew and understood that monuments are like analog cookies, you know, digital cookies, you click the, the button and you're shopping for shoes and you get reminded all day that you really want to buy the shoes and you buy it at the end of the day. So monuments are like analog cookies. And so they remind us of the people who are being memorialized, the values of those individuals and the people who erected those monuments. And so we see a correlation, the 710 Confederate monuments are also located in states that have banned women's reproductive rights, banned critical yeah. race theory. Yeah. And so they are analog cookies and they remind people of those values. Boy, that's a great point that they are in those same places. But what but, else is on the agenda, you know, post uh, embrace? I know there are more monuments, but also educational programs, the center, you have a, a you have a, give us, fill in some of those blanks. You know, we're working on two more monuments. And so one of the monuments that we're, we're hoping to erect is over near the emancipation, emancipation plinth. And so stones away from here, there was a statue of, of President Lincoln and a formerly enslaved person who was nude. They took it down in 2000. And so we're, we're hoping to reconstitute that plinth. And so every year, in a similar way as in Dewey Square, uh, support an artist to reinterpret emancipation every year. We're building the National Embrace Center. And so on the site of where we're building the National Embrace Center was a jazz club. And so that area was musical. And you know, I think in this moment where we're reimagining the, the big dig and understanding what happened, um, this last undeveloped urban renewal parcel of land that was supposed to be a highway, uh, we're bringing jazz and music back to that through the National Embrace Center. You, you know, Marjorie never misses an opportunity to embarrass us with the truth. Whenever we're talking about black history, she says, I am embarrassed, as am I, about oh, how yeah. little I know. we know. You know, it's one thing not to know what happened in Tulsa. It's not, I'm not defending it. I'm just saying we didn't know about it till the 100th anniversary or in Louisiana or somewhere else. Mm. I think people who live in the state who consider themselves enlightened know very little about the history of Massachusetts in terms of black America. I mean, everybody, I think, will say we were the, we were the first state to abolish slavery, slavery, but something that came before that was not something. And the first state something. to legalize it. Yeah. Exactly, first state to legalize. Yeah. So how much is education, public education, particularly when there's a really loaded topic on the agenda that you're involved in too, reparations. How much is education part of the program? I mean, it's critical, right? It, because I think to your point, I think there is a lot of things that people don't know about our state. And so in this moment, the HBO Max uh, docu-series that came on there about the Charles Stewart case. Yes. We have the 50th anniversary of the busing uh, decision and the implementation. Uh, we also have the anniversary of the Big Dig and the, the highway project. And so I, I've run to a lot of people that say, you know, I didn't know about the Charles Stewart case. 
I'm, I'm so surprised because I think if you see Boston and you understand the leadership of Boston, we, we've come a long way from that, here, that period. But there's a lot of ghosts that are still around and when there's resistance to change, those ghosts show up. And so I think for some folks who haven't been in Boston as long as some of us, I think it's, it's been enlightening, it's been educative. And so we, we, we need to talk about the past in order to move forward. Yeah, that Charles Stewart thing for people that haven't seen it, it, it is really incredible. They did a great job with that, showing that... The and, and our two co-chairs, uh, Reverend Brown, who is also one of the co-founders of Embrace, and uh, former city councilor Tito Jackson were featured yep. um, in, in that docu-series. And so I think to, to, to have Embrace uh, be a part of that process, it was important because I think part of the work of reparations is truth and reconciliation, so you have to acknowledge the past. Yeah, but the, the divide on reparations, uh, you should tell people if they don't know what your contribution to this was. We know there's a task force. We spoke to the chair, Joe Feaster, maybe six months ago, eight months ago, a little bit behind schedule, but they're working, they're doing a lot of research. Explain what your contribution is and explain, if you would, how concerned you are that there still appears to be this yawning racial divide on the issue. Yeah, you know, embrace concerns itself with social infrastructure. And I think a lot of times in this moment, we're talking about physical in infrastructure, buildings, roads, but the social infrastructure is the things that bind us, that, that build relationships amongst us. And so that's where embrace does its work through our activations and through the festival. And so this idea with reparations is really addressing this poverty of empathy. And so there's one thing to make someone whole, but there's a, this challenge where making you whole gives me uh, pause, makes me uncomfortable. And so Heather McGee posits in her book that some of us that part of racism and white supremacy is that we have this zero sum thinking yeah. that has occurred, that if you get something, I somehow lose something. Uh, if you get something, I'm, I'm somehow diminished. And so I think reparations is all about that conversation. Why wouldn't I want you to be whole, especially if it doesn't impact me negatively? I, I should want you to be whole because I mean, we're both human beings, we're neighbors, and I think that is the challenge of reparations that Embrace concerns itself with. And you're, you consciously, in the, your contribution to this uh, reparations debate, avoided and acknowledged you avoided the issue of who is entitled to reparations. Why did you do that? You know, that's a tough conversation. Boston has always been a city of immigrants, especially black immigrants. Uh, we did a study with the Boston Foundation, the Boston Indicators Project, the immigration to migration that talked about Boston's black migration of, of our community. And so Beacon Hill was the historic black center of Boston, uh, which is one of the reasons why the embrace should be there. We want to honor the history of that neighborhood. But Boston is a city of immigrants. There are a lot of people from the West Indies, from Africa, who did not come to the United States through the great migration from down south. And so when we talk about reparations for who, you know, myself, I'm, my family's lineage, lineage traces from North Carolina. We entered the country uh, through the transatlantic slave trade through South Carolina. Should I be eligible for reparations that's paid uh, for formerly enslaved people from Boston? I'm, I'm not so sure. Perhaps North Carolina owes my family that debt. And so I think part of the work is uh, tipping the domino for a national conversation. This is really a federal conversation. And the more states and the more cities that bring this up, that have this conversation, the more that we can elevate this to a national Are level. Are you comfortable making that decision? Who are you comfortable making the decision as to who, assuming that the American people and its governments bought into the notion that reparations are due, as they have been given in the past to other populations by our government, who are you comfortable making the decision as to who the people are, who are the beneficiaries? Well, I, I think first and foremost, what I will say is I think descendants of formerly enslaved individuals should be entitled to reparations, full stop. Uh, I also think that folks who have also been victimized by state-sanctioned racism should also be compensated. And so when we think about neighborhoods like Grove Hall in Boston, which was the largest Jewish community in Massachusetts prior to redlining, and so there were Jewish communities, uh, Jewish folks, Asians, uh, Latinos, and black Americans who were in this one neighborhood, and through redlining, it, it disseminated, it dis, you know, destroyed this um, diverse community through redlining. And so should those families also be compensated because of this state-sanctioned racism? We would say yes. Should they be the first? Maybe not. But should they be compensated? Absolutely. 
We're talking yeah. to Maria, uh, Mari Paris Jeffries from Embrace Boston. Well, we said this before, but we may as well say it again. I think uh, there's a lot of ignorance, and I include myself among that group of people that didn't really think about the, the racism that continued right through you know, World War II with the GI Bill, with redlining after that, with difficulty people getting mortgages, and they put scam mortgages, and the segregation that was in Boston and the schools and all that. To I mean, now. How about the kidney discussion we had the other day about black people in need of a kid kidney being yeah. pushed to the back of the line? until, what, a few months ago, Because actually. of racism in, in, in medicine. But I also wanted to mention, too, tell, tell people who don't know the story about the lawsuit um, involving this, uh, this uh, black running group, the Trailblazers, and the Boston Marathon, because we're right by the finish line here. This was about last year's race, yes. but the suit is still going on. Yes, and so, you know, lawyers for civil rights have, have taken on the case, and so last year they were a group of revelers celebrating some of the black runners from this running club. Uh, and as they were celebrating, as many people do, so if you've ever run the marathon from the beginning all the way to the end, there are people on the sidelines yep. celebrating. There's concerts, there's music, there's barbecues. And so this group of people were celebrating in a corner, and they were discriminated against. They were blocked. Um, people thought they were celebrating too hard. Um, and, it, and it created a tense situation. It was unwelcoming, uninviting, discriminatory in nature. And so I think this lawsuit represents uh, the, a, a redress to, to what they feel the BAA and the city of Newton have done uh, t that diminished their ability to participate as supporters. Yeah. You know, when I read that story, I said this to Marjorie, is that I read it immediately after reading what I thought was a pretty good editorial in the Boston Globe, and I admire their editorial page, talking about how the marathon is this thing in these polarized times that brings everybody together, it does. and you're not in agreement, and then you see, well, with some exceptions, and the exception that almost always exists, far too often still here, is around matters of, uh, of race. I have one more thing for you. Just You're I want to mention that in, the, in the story that Matt Stout and Travis Anderson did about this in the Globe, talking about uh, police officers forming this human barricade, uh, separating. Yeah, the these. picture doesn't look good. Yeah. It, it looks terrible. Yeah, and 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 that people uh, in in this group felt really traumatized by the cops in front of them, the cops behind them, and. I, you know, that can be a little scary, I think. And, and the magic of running the marathon is, you know, if you start in Hopkinton and you end up here on Boylston Street, like the, the culture changes through the cities, and so that's the magic. Yeah. And so I can imagine as a group of runners going to that section and seeing a different type of celebration, you get energized, especially at that point in the, the course. So it, it's, it's discouraging. Um, it's unfortunate that that happened. And, you know, I think we have to figure something out because it is one of the few places that we have left in Boston that brings people together. That's free. Um, that's, that's important right. when we th think about building third space. We, we have to think about these free spaces that's welcoming to all groups. Uh, and the marathon is one of those things. And so it's, it's unfortunate that that, that it has happened for this, this institution, this Boston institution. You know, Mari, we only have a couple of minutes left, but I, I wanted to touch on one more thing because we were both curious about what you're doing on this front. We talk a lot about uh, uh, the environment on the show and climate change. Yesterday, Bill McKibben was here, Rob Stoner from the Tata Center at, uh, at MIT around energy issues. And uh, there was also a really uh, terrific piece in the Globe the other day about environmental justice communities. And we all know historically, when you have infrastructure for fossil fuels, you plop them in communities with people with the least power, maybe don't speak English as well as other communities, have less wealth, et cetera, uh, greater percentages of people of color. But what I had never thought about, another embarrassment to quote Marjorie, was the good news is green energy is happening, however, Green energy infrastructure is going in the same place, place that could be open space, not going to Wellesley, it's going to East Boston, it's going to Chelsea, whatever. You're a, a, one of the leaders of some green something Green commission. Ribbon Commission. Green, what is that doing? You, you, you know, we mentioned it in our own harm report that environmental and climate is one of the eight injury areas mm -hmm. that have impacted communities negatively. And when we think about these infrastructure projects and where they exist, uh, the type of emissions that they emit in the neighborhoods, particularly these environmental justice communities, you know, cause the type of asthma and other health problems that, that we've been talking about earlier, um, earlier on in this conversation. And so I think we're, we're trying to elevate the ways in which communities of color need the type of advantages uh, particularly as we, we're all thinking about this existential crisis of climate. And so because we understand that communities of color, poor communities, working class communities, usually are at the bottom of almost every disadvantage, uh, we need to think 
forwardly uh, and, and place up front these communities. You know, one last thing. We have, uh, Jamie just reminded me, on Monday we have the regional EPA administrator, David Cash, and on Wednesday, for the first time, I met her at an event, uh, actually not too long ago, the state's new climate chief, Mel Melissa Hoffer, and one of the things uh, Maura Healy talks about a lot, and I think she deserves credit for this, the first climate chief type position in any state government in the country who basically looks at the climate implications of every department. Are, is that administration sensitive to the issues that we were just talking about? I, I think they are because we, we've been, I think in that story what it talks about as we try to retrofit these green uh, stations and move away from fossil fuel stations to, to green stations, we, we have to be in better dialogue with environmental justice communities. I think eight out of the 12 new yeah. stations are in those mm -hmm. communities and, and you have a, a, a majority of people who are unavailable to, to be civically involved in the way that they need to, or, or we want them to. Uh, they are mostly not English speaking, so they're not understanding what's happening. And so they're having these stations placed in communities and, and the most least empowered communities. And so I think those are the, I think the intention is always good. I think this, this idea of considering environmental justice and communities of color first, um, I think we all have some work to do on that. Yeah, part. I remember during COVID, it, 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 there was so much uh, revelation about uh, uh, kids, uh, well, grown-ups too, with asthma problems and breathing problems because of living f and growing up in places where there was such pollution in the air from all these uh, fossil fuel stations. I mean, and this East Boston thing, we talked about this huge uh, substation there that I guess they thought they weren't going to get and they lobbied to get to vote against it, against Eversource, and somehow they lost. And, <laughs> and if you go to that neighborhood and, and, you know, it's one of those exits, if, if you're going to the airport and you accidentally <laughs> get off the wrong exit and you have to turn around, you can see it as yep. you're turning around. It, I mean, it is smack dab in the middle of a neighborhood, right stone's throw from people's homes, yeah. right near a park where, where children play. There's a baseball field right there. So it, it shouldn't be there, right? And so it, it, it's, it's you know, incredibly uh, unfortunate that it, you know, despite community's efforts that they are still putting this smack down in, in the middle of a neighborhood. You're doing great work. Amari Paris thank Jeffries, you. great thank to you. see you as always. Yeah, see thank you, again you so much. Thank you so much for coming in. We've been speaking with Embrace Boston Executive Director Amari Paris Jeffries. After a quick break, we're going to open up the phone lines and text. This is a big story, but it's finally spring, so we're going to do it today anyway. We're asking the big, tough questions here, and that is, is it ever okay to wear sandals to the office and let everybody see your toes. You're listening to Boston Public Radio, 89.7 GBH. We are broadcasting live from the Boston Public Library and streaming at youtube.com slash GBH News. I'm Jared Bowen. Coming up on The Culture Show, our Arts and Culture Week in Review, live from the GBH studio at the Boston Public Library. First up, the Venice Biennale. It's simmering with political tensions, complaints that it's featuring too many dead artists, and a huge pile of dirt, corpse-like figures, and a space odyssey and vibe make the German pavilion a hit. Plus, we'll remember Faith Ringel, the innovative artist who explored black life and history. It's all here on The Culture Show, today at 2 on 89.7 GBH. Our programs are made possible thanks to you. And Liberty Mutual Insurance. Liberty believes progress happens when people feel secure and exists to help people embrace today and pursue tomorrow. Learn more at libertymutual.com. And the University of Massachusetts Amherst Mount Ida Campus in Newton, connecting students and employers in greater Boston and offering on-campus graduate and pre-college programs. Learn more at umass.edu slash Mount Ida Campus. Welcome back to Boston Public Radio. Jim Browdy and Marjorie Egan. By the way, CNN is reporting the full panel. There's a fire actually outside the courthouse in New York City, the Trump courthouse. A full jury panel has been selected, meaning 12 jurors and six alternates. And that in all likelihood, even though we haven't heard confirmed, means the opening statements could be delivered in this historic trial on Monday. But we're going to turn to something else first. Do we know what the fire's about? No, we, but I assume our colleagues will find out, Marjorie, and so will we. Okay. In any case, when winter turns to spring, Marjorie and I turn to talking about sandals and toes being exposed at the office. 
Today we're inspired by a New York Times piece about the etiquette of wearing open-toed shoes to work. Our number to call or text is 877-301-8970. What's your take on sandals in the workplace? Do you look at your coworkers differently when you can see their toes in full view? And is there, as I believe there is, a gender divide? Is it okay for one gender and not for another gender or another gender? And while we're at it, Marjorie, if we can kill two birds with one stone, let's throw Birkenstocks into this discussion <laughs> and as to whether or not it is ever appropriate to wear Birkenstocks with socks or without. 877-301-8970. Well, whenever we have this conversation about toes in the office, mm -hmm. I always mention one of my favorite Boston Globe columnists. She's been gone one. for years, but when I was young, I used to idolize her work, Diane White. She and she wrote a great column about the correct toe cleavage. Explain what that is. And that means how many toes should you show to have the sexiest uh, looking foot when you do wear your uh, open-toed shoes to the office. And what she said was that you should show the top of your big toe and the top of your second toe. And really, that was it. Just that little hint right there I'm of the toe her. cleavage. And that was the way to She's go. She's talking about women, by the way. Yes, that's right. You do not want like an inch and a half of toes showing, and you don't want all your toes showing. You just want that soupçon. The little, the big toe put. and the second toe, and then everything else in disguise. Okay, so can we agree? And of course, these days, you know what you have to do? What? You have to paint your toenails. Yeah, you do. Everybody paints their toenails now. Do we agree that men should never wear open-toed shoes to the office, I sandals, think, or anything else? Uh, yes know, or no? Well, I, I suppose if you're a man that has a nice pedicure and you got your well-maintained so the answer toenails, is no. I think very few men are really doing their toe. A beauty treatment as much as they should. You know How do you mean? feel about Birkenstocks? Don't like them. Okay. How do you feel about them? I don't like them is on a good day is how <laughs> I feel about them. And I don't like them on women. I don't like them on men. I don't like them on anybody. And the only thing worse than bare feet in a Birkenstock, mm -hmm. which is really bad, are white ankle length socks in a, a Birkenstock. Oh, that's bad. That is no, that's, really bad. That's very, that's but our very, primary very topic are exposed toes of the workplace. 877-301-8970. Where are you on this issue? And it's also thought to be a liberating thing, you know? It, what do you mean? It, well, as New York Times points out this little story about open toes at the workplace, for months your, your feet have been trapped under layers of socks and boots. Yeah. And this is a liberation uh, for your feet to feel the breeze on your bare heels Yeah, but and you don't toes. have to be liberated at the office. This is about the office. But I am fine with men wearing... I have those sandals. I told you, made by the Rolos. We've seen them. Well, they're handcrafted, Marjorie. Yeah, you don't like those either? <laughs> no, they're okay. They're, they're not okay. Know, they're extraordinary, your toes are great. actually. You have great toes, I wasn't Jim. talking about Everybody my toes. So. I was talking about the sandals. <laughs> and in a non-workplace setting, uh -huh. I'm fine with anybody doing it. Let your what did the uh, let your freak flag fly, yep. or whatever the hell they said, okay. Crosby, Seals, and Nash. But in the office, it is not appropriate for men ever. Okay, My, Matt in the car agrees with you. Birkenstocks you are never acceptable at work, out of work, inside, Good. outside. They should be outlawed, says Matt, along with Crocs. Well, <laughs> Crocs are for another day. We've had Croc shows too. We're going to limit this to bare toes at the office. And <laughs> by the way, I've no, you don't. You, despite your equivocal position, you have criticized men wearing sandals to work almost every time you've ever seen men wearing sandals to work. Every time. Well, it, so why are you it, trying to be fairer and it, kinder it, and because gentler? Because I, well, I, I don't think men, I, I don't think men's toes, you know, are up to snuff. Well, I that was my point. Women's toes are much nicer, generally speaking. That's I would beautifully say. put. Let's yeah. start with Marie. And plus, plus the women's shoes are pretty sexy. You know, the summer shoes, the open-toed shoes, mm -hmm. the the uh, slingback shoes. You know, uh, with the back, the backless shoes. I mean, the women have really pretty mm. shoes, and a lot of women now spend a lot of time at the. Uh, at, 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 at getting pedicures, they so do. that's lovely. Maria from Worcester, what do you Hi, think, Maria. Maria? Yes, I think it all depends on your line of work. Okay. Okay. Like what? If you work, for example, if you work at a high school, I think it's okay. But if you work in Wall Street, you're not going to be marching into a meeting with open doors. So I think it depends on your line of work. You know, that's a great point, Maria. If you were getting a divorce, would you want your divorce lawyer uh, to show up with open-toed shoes? Why, you probably would, you, why would, would you care? Because they're not, they're not as serious as, 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 as closed shoes. And then you think, if you're in New York City, you have to think about where you're going, you know? I mean, sometimes the subways in oh, New York you're can be a little bit dirty. I mean, do you want to have... Maria, that's a great point. But Maria, don't go away. You say it's okay if you work at a high school. If a man works at a high school, is it okay with you? Well, I think I think whether you're female or female or male, if you have manicure toes, oh, that's go for position. it. 
But go for it. disgusting, it's kind of it's not. I think we all agree if your toes are disgusting, it's probably a bad idea regardless. That's a very fine point. Maria, thanks for sharing this with us. We appreciate it. Okay. Uh, uh, the, uh, this person called in a long time ago, and the topic was people's ugly toes and sandals, and that's what we're back to today. But comfort is first and foremost, says this texter. I remember when women had to uh, march for pants, to wear pants in the office, liberation for feet. What was that, like 80 years ago? How long is it going to say women couldn't wear pants to the office? Oh, my goodness. I think a lot of places women didn't wear pants. Really? Probably right through the 80s. Yeah. I mean, but that was a while ago, but not that long ago. By the way, uh, the story on the fire outside the uh, Trump courthouse, it appears someone was on fire. Not oh. sure if they set oh, themselves God. on fire. Many news stations are apologizing for panning to the fire once they realize oh. there was a human being on fire. This is via CNN and MSNBC. That's horrible. That is horrible. It's totally horrible. Justin and Somerville, we're talking about uh, a really important topic. Bare toes, exposed toes in the office. Welcome, Justin. Jim, Marjorie, I hope you're doing well. Long time listener, we long are. time caller. Thank, Thank you. Hey, I, uh, this, is a, yeah, this is an interesting hybrid Crocs. Yeah. They're, they cover the toes, but there's holes. And you've got an exposed ankle. What's your opinion on that? I have to say, I've saw a lot about this, Justin. I'm glad you asked. I am comfortable with Crocs. I do not wear them, but I'm comfortable with any gender wearing Crocs to the office. The bare ankle doesn't trouble me. It's the toe. And I can live with the holes because the holes are so finite, so small, that you really can't see anything. What's your position, Justin? Well, if you've ever put a pair of those bad boys on your uh, feet, you fall in love with them pretty quickly. You get pretty spellbound. Uh, I'm still on the fence about how, where I wear them in public. You know, uh, I, I prefer a nice shoe when I'm out uh, out there in the world. Mm -hmm. But in the house, it is a go-to house shoe. For well, sure. you're a man with strong opinions, Justin. We appreciate that. Thank you for bringing Crocs into the conversation. 877 Zero one eighty nine seventy. I'm going to say no to sandals. I used to wear open-toed heels to work, and my much younger coworker was obsessed with my feet. It was so creepy the way he stared at them. Well, there are a lot Ooh. of foot fetishes around. You I know. know that, I, I lived there across the hall from one in college. You it did? Was, yeah. He used to wear oh, that tape. guy came in and rubbed yeah, your feet. Yeah, that was bad. What was, was that bad. about? Well, he he, 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 uh, he came in and asked if he could touch my feet. And, and what did you say? Well, I, I, I was... You said he, yes? Because I, I was not alone in the room. You and said I yes? Just, I just shut down the 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 co-ed showers and I was viewed as kind of a you know no fun so you had to give the feet? Bostonian yeah but after about thirty seconds that was enough of that but we used to this do this is Stanford this obviously. is Stanford and people this guy would be um, watching for parties when we would be standing at the phones or standing up having a drink and mm -hmm. he would suddenly come around and caress their feet that was he weird would? yeah he wore a cape too all the how time how long that did you date really him I know oh my oh. God never got close never got close you let it, the guy touch your feet very briefly very I didn't want to seem like a total uptight person from Boston that was ruining everybody's fun you know that's what they thought how of long me. did the co-ed showers last not long. We Would they have lasted if it weren't for you? Well, I, well, I asked uh, a couple of women if what they thought about them, they and the women did not like them. They did to say no, they didn't. It was ridiculous. It was ridiculous. So we got rid of those, and then I didn't want to be seem like I was just a total square. You know what I mean? Take Jesse my feet, from, Jesse, please. Jesse from Boston. Thank hey, you for Jesse. calling. Hi. Uh, thanks for taking my call. Thanks. Um, I'm actually a <laughs> I'm actually a former associate producer at WGBH, but I changed oh. industry. Really? And, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm a big fan. Thank you. Um, but um, when I was, yeah, absolutely. Um, when I worked there, I actually had um, foot surgery and, on both feet. Um, so um, I had to wear open-toed sandals. And at the time, I didn't have a choice, but I had to explain to my supervisor that I had the, first, the surgery and I needed to wear open-toed shoes. But now, as a nurse, I wouldn't think of wearing open toe shoes. Yeah, you can't um, as a nurse. So, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it, it definitely depends on the industry, necessity, and, you know, function. What are you doing now, Jesse? I, I'm a nurse. Oh, good for you. That's yeah, you great. Can't, you can't have nurses in open toed shoes. Well, it's good to talk to an alum. Thank you very much for calling, Jesse. A lot of nurses wear clogs. I know they do. Not Crocs, but clogs. I have seen What's a nurse. A clog I, and a croc? Well, the Crocs usually have the, the, the little holes in the but top. But it's the same of construct, through. right? Construct, but they're, and they're often slingbacks. Huh. Crocs. Huh. And the uh, clogs often have. Uh, well, there's. You wear clogs. You wear something like yeah, that. Yeah, I wear clogs. Clogs are very. Uh, you see a lot of physicians and nurses. You do. Wearing. Um, uh, 
Clogs. Clogs, thank, thank you very you. much. You're welcome. Ian in Hyannis, what do you think, Ian? Um, I'm a big fan of sandals at work. I, um, when I worked for the Department of Public Utilities and we mm. had uh, something of a dress code, I still had something. sandals with no socks. On the other hand, as a former mountaineer, I take very good care of my feet. Good. So toenails clipped, everything yeah. neat and clean. That's great to hear. That's good, because a lot of men don't do that. Yeah, how would you feel if the guy at the next, uh, whatever, a desk over was not a mountaineer, Ian, and was not taking quite as good care of his feet as you do? Would you be okay with that? I would hope that I had a long summer cold so I couldn't smell anything. <laughs> That's beautifully put, oh, Ian. Thank you for the call. By the way, on the note we were mentioning before, no update on that horrible fire, the self-immolation thing. However, Maggie Haberman of the New York Times is reporting that Donald Trump once again fell asleep in court. This marks the third time he has fallen asleep in the courtroom, according to reporters who were... Uh, who are present. I, 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 how probably, much would you love to see that? He's probably got sleep apnea. You know, maybe he doesn't get enough sleep at night, so he just sleep during the well, he's day. 77. He's he 77. He doesn't exercise. I'm like Biden, yep. who exercises like a lot. I mean, Trump is not exactly a physical specimen. He's probably tired because he's old and tired. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, okay, 877 yeah. is the uh, phone number Oh, we have call. a pro-Birkenstock call. Oh, pro-Birkenstock call. From Let's Somerville, right of course. Dan, of course, Dan from Somerville. Hi, Hi Dan. Hi, Daniel. Hey, how's it going? Um, I'm a big fan of Birkenstocks. Wow. Um, they're, well, I mean, I think they're sort of like, they're, that's what like Moses wore, that's what <laughs> Jesus wore, that like fine brown leather. Yeah. They look really great on, yeah. on your yeah. feet. Um, I don't know. I don't, I don't see why you're not a fan. That's, that's the issue. I, I, um, why are you not a yeah, fan, Jim? I don't, first of all, you know that Somerville is the international capital of the Birkenstock. You know that, Daniel, correct? Uh, thank God. Yeah, thank God. Exactly. <laughs> I, I well, can't when articulate. Come, when you come here to, Jim, yeah. when you come to shop at Market Basket, wear your Birkenstocks. That's a, if I had them, I wouldn't wear them. I, and Daniel, I am embarrassed. You asked me a question that I can't articulate a clear answer to. I don't know why I hate them as much as I do. But you know, there's certain things you know when you see it. Who was it? Potter Stewart who said, I can't define obscenity. Yeah. He was a Supreme Court justice. I know it when I see it. Well, I can't tell you why I hate Birkenstocks, but I know I hate them when I see him. And if I do better, Daniel, I'll get back to you. Thank you for your call. See you at Market Basket. A couple of people have texted to ask about your Morton's toe, Jim. No, can I tell you something? You do, I knew this was going to come up, and I actually was going to write down that you were going to do this. Every time we have this discussion, which is usually once a year, the Marjorie brings up the same Morton's tire toe. point. First of all, explain what it is. And let me say, in light of the fact that they're my toes, not yours, <laughs> I don't have Morton's toe. And if I did, it'd be perfectly fine. But Marjorie is obsessed, like fetish-like, with this, what yeah. is Morton's toe? Explain to people. You, I think you had your second toe shortened. So okay, you, you can toe. do that. By the way, Morton's toe is not like a disease. Morton's no. toe is when your second yep. toe, the one that's next to your, what do you call the big toe? Big toe. Big toe. <laughs> the thing that's next to your big toe is longer than your big toe. That's fine. Yeah. That's fine. And Marjorie is not fine with her, apparently. But let me also say, I don't have it. And you've been saying for 25 years, I have it. I didn't have it 25 years ago when you first said it. I don't have it today. So... What is up with this? I think you should take off your shoes. I'm not taking off my shoes. Of your feet on the website. <laughs> and tweet. <laughs> you Why don't you do an AI feet. of my feet and see what though, comes up? He does have huge Pointing feet. Have you noticed that when he sits back and puts I'm his feet up? I'm six foot five, I know Marjorie. It. They, they, they're a big feet, man. Well, let's leave it at okay. that because that conversation you know could go about, in really bad places. Do you know anything about camel toes? Yes. Okay. Well, uh, Andy Plymouth uh, says he's not impressed by people wearing Birkenstocks or Crocs to work or men wearing sandals, uh -huh. but he's really, really upset about camel toes. Uh -huh. Would you explain what camel no, toes are? No, I will are? not, because we're going to get the same thing as the Morton toe thing. Steve from Newbury says, what do you think of toe rings? What do you think about that? I love them. So do I. <laughs> so, <laughs> Listen so, to you. So do I. Okay, would you, why don't you describe the foot you like with the toe ring on it, Jim? Well, as Potter Stewart once said, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Luckily, we're running out of time, and of course, the lines are full because this is what people care about. Jerry, you're in Belmont. You're on with Marjorie Egan and me, Jim Brady. We're talking about yep. feet at the office. Hi, Jerry. Hi, you guys. Hi. Um, hey, I love your show. Thanks. And one of the reasons I love it so much yeah. is because you are hands down very amusing. We try. Wait, and which one of us? The two of you. Oh, both okay. of us. Okay, I was worried. Go ahead. Well, thank it you. It's all about the 
It's about the chemistry, guys. Thank you. You're it very, very kind. Chemistry. That's right. But what do you think about the, the issue at hand, Joe Jerry? It's been our signature. <laughs> I'm going to tell you. I'm yeah. going to tell you. Yeah. It's because I get amused that yeah. I'm willing to call in oh. and share. I think you both are. <laughs> and the reason I feel that way. Is Wait, we didn't hear what you said. The reason I feel oh, what way? We lost you. We both have Morton's tone. Oh, okay. God. She didn't say no, that. I think, no, no. I think you're both a little bit uptight on the topic. Okay. Oh, okay. Well, take it away. You're, well, do, you're do free. help us out. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. I am a person who has, I don't have black feet, but I always need arch support. That's great. Okay. Yes. And so I wear Birkenstock. Oh, That's sad. okay. I'm sorry to hear that. <laughs> well, I'm sorry for you, Jim, because you're missing out. Well, what is and it that I'm missing in Birkenstock? You and Daniel from Somerville, obviously they're huge in Belmont too. What am I missing out on Birkenstocks? And I'll, I'll, I'll take it into under consideration. What am I missing out? They're excellent quality. Yeah. They're a fantastic company. They're supporting a great company. They are? Oh, I didn't know. Uh, that actually matters to yes, me. Yes, they're yeah. an amazing company. Okay, yes. fine. And they will last forever. Wow. Um, and they will repair them. They do? Not only that. Yeah, and they they help your they help your posture, they help your hip placement. Yeah. The other thing I want to say Please. is if, if, unless you work in the food industry mm -hmm. or the medical industry yeah. and even the dental industry, yeah. as long as your feet are clean and your toes are, your toenails are cut, yeah. you can wear sandals in the heat of summer. Let okay. me ask you something, Jerry. Jerry you've been you. thinking a lot about this, haven't she you? Has. She has. Only because you brought it up. Okay, Only well, you, that was an excellent call. Very thoughtful, very comprehensive. And thank you for the call. Which of our coworkers wrote, I grew up thinking Birkenstocks were so dumb looking? Who is that? Yeah. Who is it? Hannah. Hannah. Hannah, Hannah our colleague, who's really the outdoors person here. I would think she'd be. Oh, here's the. Oh, here. I grew up thinking Birkenstocks were so dumb looking. Then I moved to Somerville. <laughs> uh, Where everybody Floridians wears prefer them. flip flops. That's true. That is what happens. You move to Somerville, and that's what happens to people. Now, Julia Nasha, Nashua is more disgusted by gross, cracked, dirty heels than open That is toes, really so bad, by the like, way. She doesn't like those. You know what at the all. one word for that is? What? Vaseline. Oh, yeah. Okay. How great is Vaseline? Vaseline we should do a wonderful. whole show on or Vaseline. Aquaphor is also good. I use Aquaphor. Lou and Walpole is very yeah. enthusiastic about this topic, Jim. He is. He says, I totally agree guy. that it's okay for a female with a fresh pedicure and I might add a four-inch open-toe mule around size six with red polish. Well, I, I, there are a lot of people, men and That's women right. and other genders, too, are into and feet. And I think you would add a little toe ring to that whole I, I, I didn't say I would. I and said I had a, a strong opinion about... Maybe a little tattoo or a little, maybe. little, little, little gold maybe chain a little around the ankle maybe. kind of thing. Maybe. <laughs> By the way, my, not only... You know, Marjorie okay, just Jim. suggests all these things. And the way she does this, <laughs> next year we do this, she's going to say I have Morton's toe, which I don't. <laughs> That I said on the air that I was into toe rings, <laughs> gold ankle bracelets, and whatever else you said, tattoos. which I did not. You, and yeah. tattoos on the tattoos, feet. Tattoos, yeah. That actually is a pretty good thing. Okay. Uh, luckily, we're done. Well, Jim, summer's coming. It so is. So you only have a couple more weeks to wait yeah. while you'll be able to kind of hang out here and check out everybody's feet. Well, you know thank what I mean? you. I'm not checking out everybody's feet, but thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you. We are done. Thank you for listening to another edition of Boston Public Radio. I do not have more than toe, but <laughs> I don't. Okay. I really don't. So I had a, you had a toeectomy. No, I did not have a, by the way, you can have a toe shortened, <laughs> but I'm not doing, I didn't do it, and I okay. don't need to, because I have, <laughs> I have a non-Morton's toe oh. kind of thing. Oh, okay. On Monday, First day for the culture show today is on Morton's toe, <laughs> so I would stick around, they're going to probe, <laughs> all of them are going to go really, go dumb.
What's trending? What's interesting? What's going on around town? We're talking all things arts and culture on The Culture Show, next on GBH 89.7. Support for our programs comes from you and Gentle Giant Moving and Storage Company, offering professional local, long distance, office and piano moving with 23 locations throughout New England and across the country. More information at GentleGiant.com. Stay informed this election season and join local political newsmakers, analysts and activists as they discuss issues and take a deep dive into local politics. Catch Talking Politics tonight at 7 on GBH2. Hey, it's Ari Shapiro from NPR's All Things Considered, here to say there's a new way to enjoy and support some of your favorite NPR shows. It's called NPR Plus. For a small donation, NPR Plus allows you to listen to a bunch of NPR podcasts. You also get exclusive bonus content from shows like Planet Money and Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me. And the best part, when you sign up for NPR Plus, your donation supports this station. Learn more and sign up today at gbh.org slash NPR Plus. Trusted. Local. News. You're listening to 89.7 WGBH, HD1 Boston, online at gbhnews.org. GBH News with NPR. What matters to you. I'm Jared Bowen. This is The Culture Show, live from our GBH studio at the Boston Public Library. Coming up, our Arts and Culture Week in Review. First up, the Venice Biennale. Artist Jeffrey Gibson, with his riot of color, is the first ever indigenous artist selected to represent the United States. At the Israeli Pavilion, artist Ruth Batir won't open her show until a ceasefire and hostage release agreement is reached. And the German Pavilion, which has been described as creepy and enchanting, is a hit for its freakout factor. Then we remember groundbreaking artist Faith Ringgold, who stitched together stories of black life. From there, it's a Coachella catch-all as the music festival enters another weekend. And piano man Billy Joel tries to sing us a song, but his CBS concert special went off the air for the longest time. That and more, yes, Taylor too, is next on The Culture Show. The Culture Show is made possible in part by a generous contribution from the Fiducia Fund. Proud to support this station's arts and culture programming. Live from NPR News, I'm Lakshmi Singh. Graphic development unfolded a short time ago outside the courthouse holding former U.S. President Donald Trump's historic criminal trial. Multiple news organizations reporting that a man apparently set himself on fire. The motive remains unclear. The incident outside the courthouse took place minutes after a full jury was selected in Trump's trial on hush money payments in New York. Twelve jurors and now six alternates selected. Next phase is opening statements. Trump is the first former president in U.S. history to stand trial on criminal charges. A New York case is the first of four indictments to go to trial. The U.S. House has further advanced a $95 billion aid package that includes aid for Israel and Ukraine. Final vote will be held tomorrow on four separate bills. Here's Speaker Mike Johnson. Even though it's not the perfect legislation, it's not the legislation that we were we would write if Republicans were in charge of both the House, the Senate, and the White House. This is the best possible product that we can get under these circumstances uh, to take care of these really important obligations. Meanwhile, U.S. official confirms Israel conducted a missile strike on Iran overnight. Iran says it shot down an incoming object and there was no damage or injuries.
youth working in homes and restaurants as well as in criminal activities like shoplifting and drug dealing. Amy Farrell directs Northeastern School of Criminology and Criminal Justice and co-authored the National Report. She says too often police and even child welfare advocates fail to recognize that children, both migrants and American-born, are victims of forced labor. We found a lot of U.S. citizen kids that faced vulnerability because they were being forced into panhandling, drug distribution, weapons carrying, gang involvement, forced shoplifting. Federal law defies child trafficking, is uh, defines it as exploiting a young person through force, fraud, or coercion. Farrell says the summer months are especially dangerous for vulnerable youth that lack of housing and adequate care. Blue Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts and the city of Boston offering five free unlocks for pedal and e-bikes to help provide support for those impacted by the upcoming blue and red line closures. The unlock codes are available to non-members of blue bikes regardless of residency and can be redeemed at any of the nearly 500 blue bike stations across greater Boston. Red Sox open a weekend series with the Pirates in Pittsburgh tonight. It's a 6:40 start. Going to be cloudy for the rest of the day today, and then a lot of rain on tap tomorrow. Sunday looks the better of the weekend days. This is GBH News. Support for NPR comes from NPR stations. Other contributors include Fisher Investments. Fisher's dedicated team of specialists provide resources on investing, retirement income, estate planning, and more. Learn more at FisherInvestments.com. Investing in securities involves the risk of loss. A new GBH News poll suggests Massachusetts voters are almost evenly divided over whether migrants, who make up half of the 7,500 families in emergency shelters, should be allowed into them at all. I think we have to recognize that it's an investment in terms of building the economy. I think what you're seeing is a split of people saying that we believe that taxpayer-funded benefits should benefit citizens who are our own. I'm Sarah Bencourt. Find the story now at GBHnews.org. Welcome to the Culture Show live at the Boston Public Library. I'm Jared Bowen. I'm Callie Cross, And I'm Edgar B. Herwick III. It's time for our Arts and Culture Week in Review. Here's what it sounded like. Shame on you! Hey! Shame on you! Following months of public pressure, Ruth Petir, the Israeli artist exhibiting work at this year's Venice Biennale, has closed her country's pavilion until a ceasefire is reached. Award-winning American author and artist Faith Ringgold has died at the age of 93. I remember when I was young and I would go into a gallery to show my work. The gallery dealer would look at my legs but not my art. I've been playing a show here every single month. Once a month for 10 years. First night of our Madison Square Garden. I had no idea how long this is going to go. honoring this year's selections for the Library of Congress's National Recording Registry. 25 audio recordings that carry special cultural and historic importance for the nation. It's a different world Ooh, and where you come from The city of love, yeah Well, as you just heard, the Venice Biennale is simmering with political tensions. Pioneering artist Faith Ringgold has died at age 93. Coachella, the desert music festival slash influencer's paradise is back, and so is Taylor Swift, who actually never left. In case you missed it, she dropped another album, Times Two. Plus, CBS does a dramatic mic drop on Billy Joel. Gene Autry, ABBA, and Notorious B.I.G. are among those inducted in the Library of Congress's National Recording Registry this year, and the cast of A Different World reunites to take on student loan debt. But first up, it's the Venice Biennale, which has really become a microcosm of the world from politics to peculiarities. If people aren't familiar with this, this is an, an annual or biannual <laughs> art fair, as the title would suggest. <laughs> Dating back to 1895, you have 331 artists and collectives participating in 87 pavilions all across Venice. I was actually there, I think it was four years ago, just wow. at the start of the Venice Biennale. And it's really, well, depending on who you are, I think the Venetians were a little bit tired of it at this point. We'll talk a little bit about that, but 
It's really where you see art take over that entire city. There are installations in the middle of the canals, sides of buildings are turned over to art, and then you have all of these pavilions, and many countries are represented in them. Uh, but it's just a look at, for the most part, contemporary art, although they do have uh, looks back at people like this year, Jean Cocteau and Willem de Kooning. Uh, but it's where the world just turns its attention to contemporary art, and it's now underway. And you should say that those pavilions and that work uh, represented there are often uh, where people turn to to see trends and what's happening in the art world in general. And it's been the place where a lot of people have really gotten their shine, so to speak, where they weren't known in other places. It's, a, it's wonderful for that as well. Yeah, I mean, it's just mm -hmm. like it's, it, it is a cacophony of art like you, you know it's kind of what it seems like i you know unlike you jared i have never been but it just it just seems like such an incredible big huge like thing that is like yeah, let's do it. <laughs> well, it's very immersive, and that's what we're finding now. Uh, it's very exciting to always look at who the U.S. representative to the Venice Biennale mm -hmm. is. Yeah. Last year, the ICA here in Boston, or two years ago, I keep saying last year, two years ago, it was the ICA in Bo Boston who presented uh, Simone Lee, so it was curated here, as had the MIT List Center in the last few years. But this year, it's the indigenous artist Jeffrey Gibson, who most recently was shown in Boston at the De Cordova Sculpture Park and Museum. So he is a queer indigenous Indigenous artist. This is the first time an indigenous artist is representing the U.S. there. I had a chance to speak with him on Open Studio a few years ago, and he discusses how his identity as an indigenous queer person impacted his art, and that's central to what we see in Venice right now. At some point, rather than trying to pretend like, no, but I'm an artist first. I'm not Native American. I'm an artist first. But all of my references initially all came from like my grandmothers and growing up with this idea of being different. And that difference is marked by the words Native American, Choctaw, Cherokee, Indigenous. I really just try to be honest to who I am in relationship to those words. And maybe that's where the queer part comes in, because I didn't grow up with an indigenous queer kind of model to look at, you know? So that was sort of one that, as an adult, I realized I'm like, oh, that's an important missing description of, of who we are. So he's really bringing his heritage to the fore, as he did in the De Cordova show, uh, sculpture show and what he's doing as I've read in Venice so that it's it, it's this immersive experience and he is somebody who has this riot of color when he's creating his installations and his art so it's colorful it's vibrant but also it explores the treatment of indigenous people the treatment of queer people there's a lot of humor that he brings into his work very experimental and if you're looking to experience it a little closer to home Mass Mocha mm -hmm. is opening its own Jeffrey Gibson show in their major major building which is the size of a foot football field in November. Because a lot of his pieces, pieces are huge. I think you, what you're striking on is that it's a huge platform for the world and art, but also a place for artists who really want to make a statement that is beyond what they're saying on uh, through their art, a political statement, um, a identity statement. That's This is a place where they look to do that because the world is at your doorstep and also you can have a chance to have a diff have different perspectives inter interact with that uh, yeah. so and and uh, you know again you just it's the scope of it right it's you're installing multiple multiple pieces into a pavilion i mean it's an experience it's like this enormous experience but one thing that i love about the choice of jeffrey gibson so there's a, a great new york times article feature on him in the lead up to this and um he has this quote in that where he says how do I relate to the United States? I have a complicated relationship with the United States. And I think right now, in this moment that we're in, I love seeing an American artist who can say, I have a complicated relationship with the United States, representing the United States on the world stage. Mm -hmm. We're in this place where, whether it's politics or culture, people are, are sort of expected either, if not to actually take loyalty oaths, to be like loyal to one thing or another. Mm -hmm. And for him to go like, it's complicated, but I'm still gonna represent this country in this like big stage, I think that's really excellent. I think that sends a good message. And as we've seen with the Israeli right. artist who right. refuses to see that pavilion open until there is a ceasefire, uh, uh, so there's a political statement there. And then there's just sort 
sort of off the wall art too, as yes. we see in the German pavilion, which everybody seems to be talking about, which is big piles of dirt and people walking around in various states of undress, and it seems to be an apocalyptic, <laughs> enchanting Sounds is how awesome. some people describe it, mm -hmm. terrifying is how others describe it. Just to go back to the, the political aspect of it, the Russia pavilion is still shut down, and the Ukrainian exhibit has a piece um, which is speaking to you know, who, who they are. I, and I, I, what I'm curious about is, do they just put the pavilions up for people to say, we're not opening them? You know, I don't know, well, how does that work? Do you, do you know? You have well, a sense I, of that? I know that the, they have typical buildings and then it's up to the, the country's organizations within those yeah. countries. Again, in the last few years here, it was the ICA and the MIT List Museums up to program it. Um, but there is, in the case of our government, it, the State Department will fund some of it, but I think it's up government by government mm -hmm. how they just declare what's going to happen within those spaces or whether it's completely independent. That's what I was wondering about because I thought that was, that was interesting. I also want to just comment uh, back to Jeffrey, we were talking about his work. So often when anybody makes a statement um, that I have a critique of the country that I also love, yep. it's really not appreciated yeah. at all. And I'm, I'm thinking about uh, so many other African-American artists have made that statement and they are definitely labeled unpatriotic. So to your point about here we are in a position where he can make that statement on a world stage and yet still be representing the country of which he has the freedom to critique is a comment to make. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, I think, okay. I, you know, yeah. I think it's a, good, it's a good thing. Yeah. Well, and I think that's a perfect segue as we talk about Faith Ringgold, who is a very, very prominent African-American artist who died this past week at age 93. And I, Callie, I think she falls into that category. Because she absolutely does. if you look at a lot of her work, it was looking at the African-American experience in this country. And she was looking at it as an artist who was never given her due for the longest time. She wasn't given the respect. Also, as a female artist, wasn't given the respect she deserved. Um, her quote is, how could I, as an African-American woman artists document what was happening around me. So she made it early on as part of her career objective to put on the page or in her quilts, because she did both, meaning put on the page, put on the wall, um, some pieces that really spoke to the complication that Jeffrey Gibson was just talking about. I am of this place, I am American, but there are some issues for me. Um, I am a woman, there are some issues for me, and I'm going to paint that or quilt that. Um, I had an opportunity to see her a few years ago here. In fact, I made it my business to go see her because she was getting up in age and I was concerned that I wouldn't get a chance to ever see her in, in person. And I went thinking, you know, she'll be a nice old lady and we'll ha you know, it'll be an enjoyable talk yeah. and we'll leave after a while. <laughs> Woo, was I wrong. <laughs> she was feisty up to the end. She was on top of her game. It was just thrilling. That's the word I would use. And everybody in the room was just so excited. All the young people and in that room, I could call myself young uh, relative to her. And it was really quite something. So just put added another luster to her work, which is also beautiful. So she could reach people on the beauty of it as well as on the messaging. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, and I love that you sort of picked up on that, that word that she uses about documenting what was happening around her because I think, you know, it, it, I love thinking about and reminding ourselves that there are multiple ways to document something. You can write an article, right? You can film and make a documentary, but also interpreting through the arts, she's documenting an experience on a visceral level that is, I think, important to also be in the public record. And like the fact that she was doing, I mean, she called that the American People series. Yeah. This is like what it was called. And it is her interpreting not just what was happening, but the feeling of what was happening, the well, resonance of that. Every time I am at the Museum of Modern Art in New York, there's her, one of her paintings from that series. It's American People series number 20, Die, from 1967. And it got a lot of attention a few years ago when there was a massive reconfiguration of that museum, a different rehang, and she was positioned, her painting, that is, was positioned right across from Picasso. 
hers is the, 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 the traffic stopper in that mm. gallery because she's depicting this scene of white and black people, young and old, women and men, and something horrific has happened. And there's lots of, there's lots of blood, there's chaos, there's racing, uh, and it is just something that brings an incredible amount of energy. Obviously, it had come to the fore her in, fore for her in the 1960s, but if you're looking at it now, it yes. feels like such a reflection of this time. I look at it every time because she has captured everything in that moment. And I, if, if people are hearing her name and saying, I've heard it before, uh, we'd be remiss if we didn't mention Tar Beach, which is her children's book. Yeah. That was so, it uh, has remained popular since she did it. The Tar Beach being the, the sort of asphalt on top of the roof where she imagined the story of this young girl um, in, a, in New York City as like where she lived, you know, making a beach of the rooftops in an, ur in an urban setting. Gorgeous, gorgeous piece and a lovely story. And also, I mean, to, you think about it, it's interesting, Callie, to hear you say that she was feisty till the end. When we look at the beginning, to think about the hills that she had to climb to get to where she got mm -hmm. to, when she went to college, she wanted to major in art. That's right. And they said, women are allowed <laughs> to go to college, but y art is not one of the majors they're allowed to take. You know, and she, w she, through her own grit, worked out a deal where she still had to kind of go in through the education department, but was also allowed to study art. So feisty from the beginning, having to fight for her mm -hmm. cause early on. Um, That's a just, great story. Just incredible. It? Yeah, I it's know. incredible. I know. Well, I would just add in a few seconds, we have less of this segment. If you are re listening to this and regretting you didn't get to see her work in person while she was alive, go mm -hmm. see the work of Lorraine O'Grady at Wellesley College yes. at the Davis Museum right now. She's just a few years younger than Faith Ringgold, and the same career trajectory for so long was told, you don't have a place in the art world. Very belatedly, she got it, and there's an exhibition of hers, both and, at the Davis Museum there and right now. And she is equally feisty yes, and just won a Guggenheim. She did. Yes. Yeah, she's yes. pretty amazing. Yes. And she's boss. Austin Bourne. Yeah. There there you go. Go. Up next, John Lennon and Paul McCartney's sons come together to release a new song. <laughs> That's next on The Culture Show, broadcasting live from the GB8 studio at the Boston Public Library. The Culture Show is made possible in part by a generous contribution from the Fiducia Fund, proud to support this station's art and culture programming. Every headline. Massachusetts, eighth year in a row with more than 2,000 overdose deaths, is a human story. Nobody's going to recover without um, a roof over their head, whether it's transitional housing, sober housing is important. Having a place where they can potentially be rescued should they overdose or even linked to treatment is an intervention that makes sense. GBH News with NPR. What matters to you? Support for GBH comes from you and Rockland Trust Bank. Their team is dedicated to bringing the vision of your business to life, providing support and advice tailored to your specific goals. Rockland Trust Bank, where each relationship matters. Member FDIC. And Explore Asheville. Cradled by the Blue Ridge Mountains, Asheville, North Carolina offers food, culture, and creativity for the whole family in Appalachia. More information at exploreashville.com. I'm Arun Roth. Coming up on GBH's All Things Considered, child labor trafficking is prevalent across a wide swath of local industries. Nahant has lost its bid to use eminent domain to stop the expansion of a Northeastern University Research Center. And this week's Joybeat, an organization that helps people turn houses into homes with donated furniture. It started with one request for help and now helps furnish over 2,000 homes each year. Those stories in all the day's news starting at 4 here on GBH 89.7. Welcome to The Culture Show, broadcasting live from the GBH studio at the Boston Public Library. I'm Jared Bowen with co-hosts Kelly Closley and Edgar B. Horwick III. If you're just tuning in, it's our Arts and Culture Week in Review, which includes the music festival Coachella, resuming tonight for its second weekend of splashy performances in the California desert. Although this year it sounds kind of interesting. I mean, Coachella is always super cool. Yeah. Everybody wants to go. It's out in the desert. It's in California. All the celebrities go. Big, big performances. It's no doubt already from last or two weekends ago. But this year, it's fascinating. Ticket sales are down. Yeah. Even so, tons of headlines are coming out about the performances we've seen already. 
Yeah, and and also, you know, having an impact. So, you know, all of the folks, no, I wouldn't say all, but many of the folks who, uh, who performed in Weekend One saw huge bumps in streaming. That's legacy artists, that's new. I mean, it's Le- Lana Del Rey, Billy Eilish, Tyler the Creator, No Doubt, Blur, Sublime, who uh, lead singer is no longer with them, but his son is singing with them. So all of them getting huge bumps in streaming. Coachella seems kind of insane and crazy, <laughs> though, doesn't it? Like, it, it's sort of, it's funny to get your head around, and I don't know if this has anything to do with ticket sales being down, but like the idea that, at least when I think of like, you know, a huge music festival, like when I was younger, like, do I want to be at the same music festival that Jeff Bezos is coming to? <laughs> you know, like th- there's something in that that it sort of feels like it's so large that like, is that really a cool time? I don't know. I'm sure it is, but... Kind of weird. Uh, you said it, brother. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I have to say, I think those ticket sales are those slow ticket sales because they'd only sold 80% um, really great going up to the beginning of it indicate that there's maybe some boredom or something that just didn't didn't appeal to the folks who have the money to go, by the way. Yeah. Uh, and and it's this, you're right, it's a scene because you just can't go. You've got to have a whole new outfits to go uh, <laughs> if you're going to be rubbing shoulders with Travis Kelsey and, 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 and Taylor, and Taylor Swift. Swift. Yeah. Um, so, you know, and maybe it's because I didn't get excited about a lot of the people that were performing. The last time I got really excited about Coachella was, of course, when it became... Baychella <laughs> when Beyonce <laughs> performed. So, there you have it. <laughs> well, I guess that's, that's all the reason we should just move on then. And we'll uh, move on to the Lennon-McCartney pairing. Here they're, they're back at it. <laughs> but it's not the Lennon-McCartney that you would think. This is uh, Sean Ono Lennon and James McCartney. That would be the sons of John Lennon and Paul McCartney. Here they are collaborating on the song Primrose. We laid on Primrose Hill didn't know it still You meant what you said An overcast sultry day all right, I think we've heard enough of Primrose <laughs> Hill. I mean, there's definitely the the Beatles vibes and yeah. DNA there. Yeah. Hey, what did you think about it, Edgar? I think it is a perfectly fine and forgettable piece of music. <laughs> you know, I mean, I think you know, I it not you know, not to be too critical of of the sons of uh, of John and Paul, but it's sort of Why like. Not? The, Well, you know, there's a reason why, like, bloodline succession hasn't worked for monarchies, you know what I mean? Just because you are, you know, came from somebody doesn't mean you've got the same stuff. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, I think that uh, both of these, uh, both James McCartney and Sean Ono Lennon have, you know, they've been in the music world for some time. They've put uh, all kinds of stuff out there. Some of it is okay. Most of it is really forgettable. Neither of them really have the inherent talent, uh, you know, that, that their fathers did for sure. They are not the singers that they were, um, you know, but it's fine. Well, well, you know, eh, good for I, them, I guess. I'm going to, Jared, quote my uh, music expert um, who had a different take prior to standing over here next to me. That would be <laughs> Edgar B. Herbert. Oh, you're third. quoting me from when I was here, off here? Here's my quote. Eh. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, pretty but, uh, unremarkable. And just to be clear, Sean Ono Lennon co-wrote, co-wrote it, yeah. and James McCartney is the, the soloist there. Their timing is right, though, because, you know, again, it's like Beatlemania again all of a sudden. Disney's streaming another, you know, the original cut of Let It Be is now streaming on Disney Plus again. I mean, it's just the Beatles publicist people are just... Well, why don't you just go get some more Beatles? Why would well, you yeah, need to... I mean, fair enough. <laughs> okay. Well, right. this is a reason that we should transition to... Oh, that's exactly what happened to <laughs> Billy Joel this week. <laughs> Poor Billy Good Joel. One. Good one. He, he was having his big concert on CBS. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of people had, did you like that? I, I had did that, like that. That was really good, Jerry. Uh, so, uh, yeah, he's planning this big concert. Well, actually, why don't we just talk about how it sounded? Here's how it played on CBS with one affiliate the other night. Live from CBS 4, this is your news now. <laughs> Poor Billy. They oh, cut off. The, no. the, the network blames a timing programming issue, so they yep. just cut away to their local news feeds, and people didn't get to hear the end of Piano Man. This is terrible. <laughs> Horrible. And if people don't understand, um, there's so much automation now at television stations. That's why people are really trying to get to the break. If you don't get to it, the machines take over. Yeah. So that's what happened. Um, but come on. 
Yeah. Seriously, CBS, this was a concert called the 100th Billy Joel at Madison Square Garden, which was honoring his 100th per- performances there. You're, really? You're not going to pay attention to this? They also spent <laughs> a ton of money and time in the lead up, like promoting the fact yeah. that this concert was going to come on. So it was clearly like a big play for them. And then for that to happen, it's like, I, in this case, this is one of those stories where, and, and there aren't many that I really enjoy doing this, where I just like to go into the social media feed <laughs> and see all of the stuff people say. You know, like people just like raking them over the coals about it. One of my favorite was, one of my favorite comments on this was from Rex Smith, who's an anchor at one of the Indian Indiana stations where this happened and he said I apologize to the people who were enjoying the Billy Joel singing on TV and then all of a sudden had to see my face <laughs> <laughs> well you know the cynical me is thinking well they're leveraging it now because yeah. it, it had pretty decent ratings and so they're airing it again tonight so they've used this as a way to say yeah. oh you can you have your second bite of the apple so you can presumably see the whole entire concert tonight it's also streaming well that leaves us about a minute and 17 seconds to, t- to talk about something that has been talked about a lot over the last, what, 18 hours now? Yes. That would be Taylor Swift's latest album drop times two. We get a surprise second album out of the deal. To uh, quote my colleague, <laughs> Callie Crossley, <laughs> from before the show. <laughs> exactly. And I like Taylor Swift, but it has a lot of sameness to it. And um, But, you know, what I think her talent really is is, is in lyrics, so I... I'll be willing to go back and try to look at, listen to some of those lyrics again to see if there's more to get from it. Well, we should play a little bit of Taylor yeah, so people get the song because let's this is her uh, all about more broken relationships. So here's a clip from Taylor Swift's la- latest fifth song. She always saves oh, her yeah, most intimate revelations yeah. for her fifth song. Uh, this is So Long London from her new album, The Tortured Poets Department. So that, that's a lot of bad relationships. Yeah, it she's had some. Over and over and over and over. Now and listen, over. I applaud her singing it to the hills. <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's, it was, it's okay. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it, 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 some reviewers had pointed out that, like, honestly, it, it, you know, like, it, the, the sort of broken relationship confessional thing is her stock and trade. And it, it actually has been a while since she had a breakup album like this one. So, mm-hmm. like, this is kind of a return to form. You could see it in such. Uh, there's a line in a variety review, which is pretty good, which says, as a culmination of her particular genius for marrying cleverness with catharsis, torture kind of feels like the Taylor Swiftest Taylor Swift record <laughs> ever. So That's if good. you're in on Taylor Swift, I think you're going to yeah. love this album. If you're not, you're going to go like, it sounds like a Taylor Swift album. Right. I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Well, we're listening to the Ooh, Wayback yes. Machine now. This hey, is a now we're talking. Edgar loves this. <laughs> we have gone all the way back to 1939 via Benny Goodman because this song, Rose Room, is among the recordings that the Library of Congress announced this week. It will add to the National Recording Registry. And this, Edgar, I know, is one of your particular favorites. Absolutely. If we hear, th- hear that guitar there. Yep. Yeah. So that's, uh, that's Charlie Christian on the guitar on this song. Now, Charlie Christian uh, played for an, a couple of years with the, the Benny Goodman uh, sextet. This song in particular is the one apparently where their like, relationship um, actually came to pass. So Benny Goodman uh, you know, had established himself, and as the story goes, you know, like one of his like managers or something was like, we really want this guy, Charlie Christian, electric guitar player. He's young, interesting. We wanted to play with you. It sounds like Benny Goodman wasn't that hot on this. So he comes up on stage and Benny Goodman calls Rose Room because the, the story goes, he figures Charlie Christian probably doesn't know this song. Then we'll be done with it. Christian rips like 10 choruses of improvisational solo, gobsmacks Benny Goodman. And then not only do they form a relationship, but Goodman's like, you're in the band. And so um, Charlie Christian is one of the most influential uh, jazz guitarists. He's very, in, he's very involved in the beginnings of bebop um, from a stylistic point of view. You also hear what would become rock and roll in his guitar playing, but he died at the age of 25 of tuberculosis. So mm, who wow, knows what would have happened? I mean, just an unbelievable, unbelievable artist. 
Um, and yeah, I love that this song is included in the National Register. I mean, this is this, this is just a great tune. And we should mention this is administered by the Library of Congress. Mm. It dates, uh, the music dates back to the 1850s. They take nominations every year. You have until October to do nominations for next year. And this is just like the film registry, which we talk yes. about, that, that gets added. It's Polka to ABBA, Benny Goodman to Bobby McFerrin this year, Perry Como to the Notorious B.I.G. Callie, I know you went through the list, and you have a favorite this year. Well, I have many favorites, but I just decided decided to pick to land on Johnny Mathis. Hey yo. <laughs> Great balladeer if a lot of folks have not uh, heard of him. Really popular in the 50s and 60s. Um, black, um, kind of suave looking and known for his uh, love songs like Chances Are is the is the song that he's going into the registry for. a fair measure of success for a black man um, at that time. I mean, you know, got into some places and spaces that uh, were really closed to a lot of people for a variety of reasons. And of course, there was always an underpinning of the, f he never came out, but he was thought to be homosexual because he didn't announce himself. So I'm just saying what was on the record. So it was always that little interesting thing because he sang all these love ballads you know, obviously to a heterosexual audience, and he was not. So I'm sure he had to deal with, grapple with that in addition to the racism that often met him. But at the same time, a lot of his songs have become classics. Uh, my parents played it all the time, which is why I know this song so well and many of his others. Well, my pick <laughs> is a little bit different, as I call Go it through on. the list. I agree, Kelly. It was hard to pick. It might be Green Day or Lily Tomlin. Yeah. <laughs> so I decided to go with Lily Tomlin. Here's a little bit of Lily Tomlin. She was added to the registry this week for becoming the her. Uh, she was be, she is the first female comedian to be added to the list for her 1971 comedy album. This is a recording, and it features her famous character Ernestine, a phone yes. operator who, as Tomlin it. reveals on the album, once had other dreams. <laughs> <laughs> this is a, a really funny album. She won a Grammy for this album. Uh, this was right around the time that she was at laugh -In, of course, before film, and then she just rocketed forth. But it's just so nice to see this recognition, and especially for somebody who, as we know, is still going strong, yeah. still, still making us laugh, mm -hmm. still has this great relationship with John uh, Jane Fonda, who keeps us all entertained. Speaking mm -hmm. of still going strong, Johnny Mathis mm -hmm. is coming to Worcester at the age of 88 and I performing in that? October. Oh so Callie, God. get your tickets. I yeah. might have to make it to Worcester. Yeah, just saying. <laughs> so, sorry to cut you off there, Jared. <laughs> That's right. But uh, if you, you, you should go back and listen to the rest of the album, too. It's really, really hilarious. And it's interesting because she's a, a little bluer than I thought she might be, oh, but mm. she's very clever in how yeah. she does it. Like the best comedians, she there, there are double entendres, there, there are layers, as I always say. There's a mathematical formula to her her uh, comedy and her stand-up routine. And it's just great. It's always great to hear a lot live comedy album to hear that energy you can almost feel that energy you can almost smell the smoke because it was in the 1970s you can almost smell the smoke and smell the drink in that room let's hear a little bit of you from one ringy dingy can uh, you do that no because you were only lip syncing for <laughs> people who were here in the library just as i was lip syncing to ernestine tomlin you know i love that th that this is included in this though because it reminds us that the national that it's about recorded sounds so yes, it doesn't yes. just have to be music it can be found sound and yeah. it reminds us that time in the 60s 70s even mm -hmm. 80s when and comedy records before Netflix specials right. and stuff, that's how people got, you know, access to these great acts. So, like, there was a time when comedy records were, like, really important, you know? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. 
Maybe I'll do it during the break, Kelly. Okay, I want to hear it. <laughs> Speaking of which, coming up, the cast of the 1980s sitcom A Different World takes us a spin through historically black colleges and universities to take on a new world of student loan debt. That's next on The Culture Show, live from our GBH studio at the Boston Public Library. If you ran a store and sold everything at half price, you'd probably go out of business pretty quickly. But at many colleges, doling out deep discounts is just standard operating procedure. It's unsustainable. It shouldn't be that difficult. If you're going to have a set price, have a set price. It's bad enough that it's 56%. The worst problem is that it is going up every year. It's a self-destructive model, and no one seems willing to stop it. Listen to College Uncovered wherever you get your podcasts. Funding for our programs comes from you. And Liberty Mutual Insurance. Liberty believes progress happens when people feel secure and exists to help people embrace today and pursue tomorrow. Learn more at libertymutual.com. And Family Services of Central Massachusetts, offering the AmeriCorps Seniors, a program of volunteer opportunities for those 55 years and older, located on the third floor of the Worcester Senior Center. Learn more at sevenhills.org slash affiliates. Voters in India head to the polls. 969 million people are registered. This could be India's largest election in history, with a lot at stake for Modi's government. I'm Carolyn Beeler. A preview as the world's largest democracy begins to cast its ballots next time on The World. This afternoon at 3, here on GBH News 89.7. Welcome back to The Culture Show. As you just heard, Aretha Franklin is taking us back to a different world. If you're just tuning in, by the way, I'm Jared Bowen with co-host Kelly Crossley and Edgar B. Hork III for our Arts and Culture Week in Review. The cast of that hit TV sitcom from the 1980s is reuniting and touring historically black colleges and universities to raise awareness about student loan debt. And they are very, very welcome from here to the White House, to the newsroom of The Culture Show. We were very yes. excited to be talking. This is the opposite of what we said earlier this is what what's the opposite of meth because this <laughs> yeah. is not as we were saying little jared little edgar <laughs> yeah <laughs> loved this show absolutely growing up loved this show. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely uh it's a different world is i didn't know till talking to you guys you know yesterday that because it's such an icon of african-american black cultural history i mean for people who were not born they can talk to you about the episodes that are still running on many cable and late night um, outlets. So the set at an historically black college, you, this, is the, this was the short summary of it, and just the adventures of Dwayne Wade and Mr. Gaines and Whitley Gilbert. Whitley. <laughs> Whitley. <laughs> All of Freddy. these characters. Freddie. Freddie that's was right. so cute. All of these characters <laughs> from the faculty and staff to the students. You really got a window into what culture on campus at HBCUs is like. Uh, a lot of it had to do with Debbie Allen. People know her as a great a dancer and director. Her work in crafting um, how that show was directed. Yeah, and they really made a big. I mean, she really she stepped in. Like, mm -hmm. it, you know, this was initially it was a spinoff of the Cosby Show, and That's it was right. going to be a vehicle for um, Lisa you know, Bonet. for Lisa Bonet, and, the, and she was in season one. And there was a lot of issues, b you know, besides the fact that Lisa Bonet got into, uh, you know, she got pregnant, and then there was a whole thing with Cosby about whether the character could be pregnant. Mm -hmm. But besides that, there were also criticisms about, you know, whether or not the show in season one was reflecting as well as it should the experience at uh, an HBCU. Mm -hmm. And so that's when Debbie Allen stepped in and, like, they really readjusted and like built this thing into an icon. And really, when you look back at it, it is from season two on yes. when it's a great show. I mean, season one's fine, yeah. but it's season two on that it really becomes the show it does. So season one was like a network invention, yeah. And season two on was, you know, 
what what really could be crafted by the the characters and the writers and Debbie Allen. Yeah, because they brought life into it. Yes. They brought storylines around HIV and consent and apartheid and teen pregnancy, right. gun violence. All of those issues came to the fore. And with this, what makes these shows work is when you have a great ensemble, which they did. Remember Sinbad? Sinbad yeah. was yeah. of course Sinbad. Walter yeah. Oaks. In this, yes, yeah, the, the yeah, show yeah, too. Yeah. But unless you think that we were the only ones super excited, <laughs> here's the White House press secretary, <laughs> Karine Jean Pierre, who welcomed the cast of A Different World to the White House to highlight HBCUs and student debt relief. She couldn't help but lead them in a sing along of the theme song. <laughs> Amazing. It's a different world. Ooh, the way it come from. Yes, <laughs> it is now. <laughs> So when we look back too, it's it's almost you know the, the, that iteration of the Norman Lear shows too yes. that yep. you yes. have a generation that sticks onto it, attaches to it. Those characters then follow you. We follow them through our lives, and you get flip up aviator gla glasses yes. that come along with <laughs> right. it. But then it's so interesting to read how successive generations through social right. media and all of the repeats have also glommed onto it. And this is so fundamental to so many people's growing up experiences. Yeah, for a lot of it's so interesting because they were talking about it the White House how a lot of kids in writing their essays and thinking about attending an HBCU said how they were influenced by what they saw uh, come out of the, of the sitcom. Yeah, and a, in a lot of the articles around this, you know, the, these college-age students are, you know, they're saying, like, my parents told me about this. This is an important show, and I was like, ah, and then I sat down and started watching, and I was like, whoa, no, this is a pretty good show. Um, and I think the other thing that's really cool about this is that the cast, and sure, like at the time, you know, it was a hit show yeah. ish. Mm -hmm. The cast were sort of out there and being celebrated ish. Yes. But it sounds like on this tour, yeah. they're even surprised. They're like, holy. <laughs> wow. This is like, we're like, all of a sudden, we're rock stars. Yeah. And like, I'm really, like, this is such a feel good story. I feel good for them. I'm That's really true. glad that they are getting the recognition for you know, doing what they did and creating this cultural icon. I love that this show has lived on and found an audience with a whole new generation of people. It's so fantastic. So you mentioned that the White House was using it as a vehicle to talk about student debt, and that was one of the conversations. Where I think several shows where kids were trying to figure out, ca the kid characters, trying to figure out how can how, I stay how, in school? Yeah. How do I, you know, have money for my tuition? There were people who were on work study and not and all of that. So they were very, uh, it was very fun. I mean, they always had the humor, but they made sure to have, as you said, Jared, all of the issues that, that were pertinent to students of that age. And I remember seeing Jasmine Guy, who played Whitley, yes. right up the street and doing um, uh, Chicago, the, oh, really? the musical. Yes. The only reason I went to see that musical is because <laughs> Whitley was in the, in the musical. And she's a great dancer she and singer, is. I should she say. Is. Well, next up, this could spell doom for the pharmaceutical industry, yeah. maybe. <laughs> but, but maybe. Uh, social prescriptions oh. are gaining oh. traction in the United States, with doctors prescribing activities such as nature walks, museum visits, and ballroom dancing. Hey so we're hearing a little bit of music about dancing right now. Uh, so this is a fascinating, fascinating thing to hit the medical industry, and I think it's gaining hold. It's definitely gaining hold in the UK, and that's where they are recognizing that in addition to t typical medical drug treatments, that they have been able to measure the effect of participating in nature, participating in art events, going to museums, looking at art, that there are health benefits, there are definite mental health benefits to this, and you find circumstances where doctors are actually writing prescriptions for these treatments, and even some universities here in the United States have signed on to, them, to this at Rutgers and Stanford universities, that students can attend cultural events as part of uh, a mental health services with their colleges, AKA, if you want to go see Chicago as a college student and see Whitley starring in it, that will be paid for by your, your university because it's recognizing yet another value of the arts. You know, um, I feel like I, this has happened in, around the people that I know already. So maybe I'm just, you know, in a, in a weird group or something, but, but this has been conversation going on in little pieces and various particularly, I think, community health organizations who are always on the front lines of recognizing that the social determinants of health are very important in terms of how they impact, um, you know, whether or not you're well. I mean, this is, this is wellness that we're talking about. So it didn't seem unusual to me that there, a doctor would say, what I need to, you know, say for you is that you need, you know, three days of 
walking or, you know, just try to think about other ways that we can come up with that will help you lower your blood pressure that requires physical activity, but just do it in a more interesting way. I just feel like there's been some involvement around that for a while. Now. I think there is, and I think no. there has been. And I think part of, like some of this, you look at it and you say, I, I think it seems like it's common sense. I think what makes this, I, I think the, the sort of place we're in now that makes it potentially important to think about is the formalizing of it, from mm. studying it to putting money behind it. I know, Jared, mm. you talk a lot about trying to make the arts free mm -hmm. for everybody. And so there has to be an economy that you build around that so that they can be free to people, but the folks who are making the art continue to get paid, right? So there's money that has to exchange hands in some form or fashion. And so the idea that we, you know, we have this whole health industry where there's a lot of money sloshing around, and if some of that money, some of that you know, insurance, if, if, this, if this is studied by insurance companies and they say, you know what? When doctors prescribe people to go to a museum twice a month and take a couple of dance classes, th you know, that's going to save us some money on the back end. If you start to see that happening, then you really see a shift in terms of the mechanism around these kinds of things happening in a more formal fashion. Like if you look at England, right, their healthcare system, they have, the, th they, they have these things they call link workers mm -hmm. when they do this. So it's not just that the doctor prescribes it, but you have basically have a caseworker yeah. who's making sure you're doing it. They're talking to you about how it's working. Those people are being paid. They, they, w they just brought 1,000 new link workers in. They're trying to get social prescriptions available to 900,000 people across the UK by the end of this year. So it's that formalizing of a, of a system that's out there that seems like it could be taking a really good, important step in a direction that might be better for a lot of people. I've yeah. seen this up close in a few different ways. One is the, the way that hospitals actually curate their art programs mm. because they oh, know having art in yeah. the hallways yeah. brings temperature, brings the, the, the blood pressure down, mm -hmm. it calms people, and they have a whole formula for what kind of art, what colors, everything, what to put in the hallways. I also saw after COVID, remember the convention center was opened up essentially as a hospital mm -hmm. for people who had just come out of severe ICU level treatment and were on their road to recovery and they worked with Longwood Medical Symphony Orchestra to have artists contribute, musicians contribute songs that they would record, they would put them onto tablets, they would give those to patients for a daily regimen, morning, noon, and night. A certain kind of music to wake you up and rouse you in the morning to get you through the day and then to calm you down at night. It was a treatment, it was a therapy treatment. Mm. And then I've also seen how Mary Gaucher, the singer-songwriter of country music and folk music, how she has worked with soldiers coming back from conflict to get out their feelings, to express their feelings through song, and, and it just gushes out of them, those feelings. It's a way to process that. She did the same thing, again, going back to COVID, for the emergency room doctors and medical teams, again, to process everything they had experienced, didn't necessarily have a way to get out of their system, but they did through song. So there are measurable effects to this, and it would be great to see, I know they have big battles ahead, with the pharmaceutical oh, yeah. industry wants to send out their pills and not notes and musicians. Uh, but there are, I think, anecdotal, lots of anecdotal evidence that can then be measured and hopefully this will become systemic. One data point in this, it yeah. looks like in New Jersey, they're, they're starting to, that you're starting to see that, right? So, you know, in Newark, there's an insurance provider that's teamed up with the art center there to sort of make the payment thing work. And uh, Horizon uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield, which is the largest mm -hmm. health insurer in New Jersey, they're participating in a study to see what happens when patients are prescribed these things. Does it impact outcomes? Does it impact our bottom line? If these things start to find that it does, we could be onto something. Well, if they can have new evidence, because there is evidence. Yes, that yes. definitely. New th evidence. Th yes, correct. Yeah, that More that evidence. Yes. <laughs> Well, that's our lightning. That means it's time for the lightning round. Ooh. This also always signals the headlines that caught our attention this week. Callie, what's yours? Well, I got uh, really excited about the debut of a, fil a little film called uh, Long Game, The Long Game, because it's a story I never heard of about these uh, Latino uh, caddy, golf caddies at the Del Rio Country Club, you know, back in the early uh, 60s, late 50s, early 60s who, you know, they could caddy, but of course they were never going to be, you know, playing golf. And one guy who got interested in their talent and trained them, you know, to be golfers, um, and they just became a, a sensation. And it, it struck me because, first of all, it's the kind of story I like, um, with a little history, uh, certainly hidden history that I knew nothing about. Also, my dad was a big golfer, and I know he didn't know this story, so this mm. would have been of interest to him. 
you know, it's just, so I don't know. It's probably one of those little movies. I'm sorry to say it's probably going to be there for one second. I'm going to have to grab it <laughs> before it goes. <laughs> yeah. But I'm still very interested in it. Oh, that sounds lovely. <laughs> That's excellent. Edgar, what was yours? Well, mine was that the uh, Olympic torch for the 2024 Summer Games was lit in Greece this week. Um, did you, I didn't, I sort of, I don't know why I didn't know this before, but do you know like how they they go into a stadium in Olympia mm -hmm. and there's like some sort of reflective surface and it's the sun's heat that is supposed to like yeah, light the torch. Know. Yeah. Really? <laughs> yeah. 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 So, and it, as like an offering to Apollo, the sun god, but apparently it was like cloudy and rainy. So they have, they have, <laughs> they basically like, they basically like have a backup lighter in like an old Cretan urn and they just like, just like pull it. so apparently they had to kind of pull out the lighter to light it. But we, um, we could have lo loaned them our lightning bolts. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, no exactly. So now it's going to travel around Greece for I think until August and then it'll they'll pass it off to the to the folks uh, in Paris and then it'll make its way to Paris. But I bring it up because if you don't recall, this 2024 Summer Games was the one That's that right. could have been happening here in Boston. <laughs> of course, this is back in 2015 yeah. and uh, Boston after like all of this sort of like machinations and stuff kind of became America said Boston you're going to be our choice to put forward to the world and basically thanks to the work of the no Boston Olympics people mm. you know they kind of said but you guys haven't really asked the people of Boston if we want this and eventually the their, through their efforts people in Boston pretty much it seems like majority came down on like we do not we cannot. I have, there is no I have way. insight there. I remember distinctly, I was filling in on Boston Public Radio mm. that day, so we did a call-in segment about that, about, oh, the Olympics are coming to Boston, almost to a person. Every call, I don't want this. <laughs> yeah. Are you kidding me? The traffic's <laughs> they, bad enough. Yeah, they, they can't. <laughs> the green line doesn't even run. How are we going to have an Olympics? Yeah, I mean, it was, but, like, this is it. Like, in an alternative universe, this if, that, if this been. bid would happen, this, we would have been in the, like, last leg of the lead-up to the Olympics. The torch would have been wild. running down yeah. the street. And yeah. we would have had tees that are running. Yeah, actually. that's yeah. true, because they would have fixed them. Exactly. That's right. Mm -hmm. Well, the headline that caught my attention, this is something I think a lot when I see movies, especially movies or TV shows that are set in cemeteries, is how do they get permission to do that, and is oh, it respectful to shoot? Mm. So this is a little bit adjacent because there's this new Apple TV series called Manhunt, which is all about the manhunt for John Wilkes Booth after he assassinated Abraham Lincoln, and that film, that, that series rather, wanted to shoot the assassination in Ford's Theater in Washington, D.C., which is is now open as a museum and a theater, but the theater said absolutely not. We don't allow any recreations of oh, the assassination because we just don't feel that there is integrity there, mm. uh, and it also basically gives lift to John Wilkes Booth in mm. their eyes. And I just thought that was very interesting because other people have apparently tried, including Robert Redford, when he did a film a number of years ago. And they, they do apparently present a play every single day, but it's more about the eyewitnesses and the actual assassination is not rendered. Interesting. Um, but it's yeah, it's very interesting to hear their take on it and how they won't allow people to do that. Uh, and also the history of that theater, that it went on, it kind of lumped, stumbled along for a couple of years yeah. after the assassination, then became a warehouse. Mm. And it wasn't really until Lady Bird Johnson that it be was returned to a theater and, and cleaned up and, and is still thriving today. Oh, that's so interesting. Yeah, I had no idea. Really mm. interesting. Mm. Need a little history lesson. Yes. Thank you, Jared. A lot of history going on well, here. Well, it's my pleasure. Yes. <laughs> well, that's it for the culture show. You can catch up on all things arts and culture by way of our podcasts, which you can find on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Callie, before we go, what's coming up on Under the Radar? Well, I got my round table talking about LGBTQ issues, including uh, new funding secured by our Massachusetts delegation for the Pride, uh, which is a, I think, one first of its kind um, unit will be development for LGBTQ senior um, uh, seniors who need housing, and that's a, that's a big issue. We're also just having a fun story about uh, a Boston.com article about suggesting that Dorchester is now the new star gayberhood. So we'll have a little discussion <laughs> about that. And also we're looking at the MFA Hallyu exhibit with uh, the curator and also a Korean uh, cultural expert. Fabulous. Edgar, what's coming up on the Curiosity Desk? We are again in one of those modes where we're taking a look at what the next couple things we're going to do are. So looking for listener questions. If there are things that you are curious about out there, do let us know. You can email me at curiositydesk at wgbh.org. Bring them on. 
And you can tune into The Culture Show on Monday for poet Octavio Gonzalez and Boston Ballet principal dancer John Lamb talking about his decision to retire after 20 years with the company. Thank you today to the BPL technical and logistics crew, Glenn Heath, Cy Patel, Josh Polonsky, Maddie Geyer, Matthew Glover, Eddie Hickey, Sandra Lopez-Burke, Isabella Karen, Carly Kokorin, and thanks to City Table, the Lennox Hotel, and the Newsfeed Cafe. I'm Jared Bowen. Have an art and culture-filled weekend. Where is my wife? Where is she? Where is she? She's just about to close up the library. The Culture Show is made possible in part by a generous contribution from the Fiducia Fund, proud to support this station's arts and culture programming. Spend your afternoon with us. Stay with us for GBH's All Things Considered at 4 and Marketplace at 6. But first, the world. A global view of today's headlines from the World Newsroom right here on GBH 89.7.